and at his cruising altitude, five to six miles above sea level, the temperature outdoors is well below zero. And this time, his team says he can make it. A live report's coming up next. Hey, Julius, it is smooth sailing so far for Steve Fawcett. He is about an hour and a half into his uh, flight over Australia and heading east. We want you to take a look at some uh, pictures from Australia this morning where it is still morning, and you can take a look at the launch. Fawcett's balloon, called the Bud Light Spirit of Freedom, took off at 8.37 St. Louis time from the town of Northam, Australia, which is a small town on the west coast of Australia. Now, there was some concern early on about this launch because of some winds that were hampering the inflation of the balloon, but the launch uh, wound up being delayed about three to four hours, and as you can see from these pictures and from what they're telling us here at Mission Control, the launch today went smoothly. Now, this is the 58-year-old Fawcett's sixth attempt at flying around the world solo. His last attempt in July of last year lasted for about 12 days before bad weather forced him down in Brazil. That was the longest ever solo balloon flight. This time, we are told, Fawcett has an improved balloon, and his team here in St. Louis says they are not feeling the frustrations from past failures. I, I don't think there is. I, I think maybe we're all just dumb. I don't know, but uh, the, the feeling I get is that there's no frustration at all. Everybody wants to come back and do it again and make it work. And they are back trying to make it work. Now, you can follow Steve Fawcett's, Steve Fawcett's balloon flight around the world, and you can, get, you can find out that information by going to the mission website, and we have a link to that at our website at kmov.com. Right now, though, as I mentioned, everything is smooth sailing with this improved balloon and a renewed spirit here. There's also something different that we haven't seen on the previous five attempts, corporate sponsorship. Anheuser-Busch underwriting part of this mission uh, by Steve Fawcett. They're keeping a close eye here at Washington University. If all goes well, this flight is expected to take about 15 to 20 days. Vicki, Julius? Matt, wow. about how much money does it cost for each one of these missions? We're not, we never get an official figure uh, every time these uh, attempts are made, but you can guess uh, with crews in Australia and crews based here that uh, the, the cost can go in uh, well over a million dollars, and with the sixth attempt, uh, it's uh, cost Steve Fawcett into the millions to try and become the first person to uh, sail solo in a balloon around the world. Well, we wish him well. Matt Sesney from Mission Control at Washington University. Thank you, Matt. We call it the tycoon balloon, and if you can't uh, do it, don't, you know, yeah, if you can't I'd afford say, it. I'm about to say, you get AB as a sponsor, though. If right. they stock the fridge on the balloon, that's gonna make it for a nice trip. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, that's true. Once again, a team of meteorologists, engineers, and students at WashU are serving as Mission Control, and Anheuser-Busch is sponsoring the trip. That would explain the name of the balloon. Hmm. Bud Light, Spirit of Freedom. Hierher kam, beschäftigte ich mich vor allem mit HIV und AIDS. Aber wegen der ständigen Zunahme der Zeckenkrankheiten wechselte ich dann meine Forschungs. At the Poplar, not bad at this. Oh man, does it look gross out there. Just moderate volume from the Route 3 merge. Coming up, Steve Fawcett is flying high over the Pacific Ocean at this hour. We're going to have a live update for you from Mission Control at Washington University next. It's about 11 after 6 right now. This morning, Steve Fawcett and his uh, big silver balloon are sailing over the Pacific Ocean. And Fawcett's cruising at nearly 65 miles per hour at 22,000 feet. Since starting the trip Tuesday night in Australia, he's flown more than 2,600 miles in his balloon. With more on his amazing journey, we want to check in with Mission Control at Washington University. Joining us right now, Barry Tobias, who's actually the assistant air traffic controller. Good morning, Barry. How are you? Good morning. Fine, thanks. Okay, when did you last talk to Steve, and what did he say? Um, the last time we talked to him was an email uh, he sent about half an hour ago, just saying that he was going to uh, get on the right frequency to talk to uh, New Zealand Air Traffic Control, which he should be entering the airspace in about uh, about 30 minutes or so. Where does that, uh, Barry, where does that put him uh, in the on the map right now in terms of how far he's traveled and, and how far he has to go still? Um, I think the camera's zooming in on the map over here. He's gone a couple thousand kilometers, and he's um, got about another hundred or so miles until he reaches New Zealand. And it's um, quite a bit far until he goes all the way around. Uh, we're looking at about another nine, 10, 12, uh, nine, 10, 11 days. And what kind of weather does he have to go through this time? Um, the weather's actually pretty good. There um, are a couple of thunderstorms around where he is, but they're actually moving out of his way. And uh, we're actually using the bad weather to our advantage to uh, get some speed and uh, hopefully make this trip a little quicker. 
Sure. Now, in terms of what forced him out of the air on his last attempt, is there any way to foresee those problems down the road and try to avoid them? Um, somewhat. What happened last time is we got a lot of, we got uh, some slow winds early in the beginning. And so by the time we got to South America, it was already 13, 14 days into a trip. And the weather forecasting that far away, the accuracy kind of diminishes. And so it's kind of a bit of luck with regard to what the weather will be like at that point. But right now we're uh, looking at finishing this whole trip in about 12, 13 days. And so we're looking at good weather all the way, so we shouldn't have the same problem. Speaking of looking, if folks want to come by, can they take a tour of Mission Control and watch you guys watching Steve? <laughs> sure, there's, <laughs> um, there's actually a public viewing area. I believe it's open from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. It's at, uh, in the Brookings Tower at Washington University. And uh, we're sort of taking a look around there right now. The folks over there right now are, are actually on the job monitoring uh, Steve Fawcett? That's correct. We should be expecting a position report in in about uh, 10 minutes and from that we'll go ahead and let all air traffic controllers know where he is and the meteorologists will continue uh, forecasting. Barry right. Tobias, thanks for your time. We'll check in with you a little bit later in the morning. My pleasure. We appreciate that, Barry. Have a good morning and our best to Steve Fawcett. Thank, Thank you. you. Patch of stormy weather over New Zealand Friday. Fawcett hopes fair conditions stay with him as he makes his way across the Pacific towards South America. Fawcett hopes to complete his around-the-world flight in 15 days. And as you may recall, he has made five other attempts. Last year, he was forced to ditch his balloon 12 days into the trip. Australia's east coast. He sailed above a patch of stormy weather over New Zealand Friday. Fawcett hopes fair conditions stay with him as he makes his way across the Pacific towards South America. Fawcett hopes to complete his around-the-world flight in 15 days. And as you may recall, he has made five other attempts. Last year, he was forced to ditch his balloon 12 days into the trip. Earlier today, thunderstorms created strong downdrafts that pushed him within 900 feet of the sea. But he gained altitude, drifted between the storms, and even got some rest. And yeah, he's been able to sleep quite a lot, um, which is something he hasn't been able to do on previous flights very much. Um, but uh, about the last sort of five or six hours, I think he's had some sleep. Fawcett's balloon is moving slowly now, about 28 miles an hour, but he's hoping to pick up speed again. He has covered some 6,000 miles. Chile flew over the Andes and into uh, Argentina near Tierra de Fuego. At about uh, 2.52 this morning, St. Louis time, he actually had uh, flown halfway around the world. Congratulations to Mr. Fawcett. Fawcett making good time as well. The flight so far has only taken about eight days. That compares to the 12 days it took on his last attempt. He's also traveling at 112 miles per hour right now. That makes it the fastest time he's made for the entire flight. I, I bet you he's gonna do it this time. I think so too. I, I have a feeling, I really do. I do indeed. It's because he's in the Bud Light balloon. It's a St. Louis Karma, it's gotta be. Go. He could make it back to Australia by next Tuesday. And State is live. She is at Mission Control at Washington University to show us that Fawcett is not out there, and he's not out of the woods yet. And No, he's not, although they have said that the past 48 hours have been so exciting. He has flown over Chile, over the Andes. He's now flying over the Atlantic Ocean. In fact, the crew here says he's not going to be flying over land again for another 10,000 miles. They say Steve Fawcett has been like a football player, weaving around bad weather by going left and right, up and down. In fact, at one point he was so low, only about 300 feet in the air, that his mission control director joked that if he'd had a fishing pole, he could have stuck it out the balloon and caught some dinner. The only problem is that some of this bad weather has forced him further south than he would have liked, and he's now flying closer to the waters off Antarctica. It would be the worst place to crash. The winds are horrendous, the seas are high, and there's no shipping close by, so... Uh, a person that goes down there, you can actually die of nausea. Uh, you have you got a 50-foot seas, you're in a little life raft. If you go down there, it's a bad situation. Okay, they're going to be holding their breath here for about the next two days, getting through that. He's got one more big storm to hit that'll probably come off the uh, east coast of Africa. By the way, you can follow his progress on our website, KMOV.com. Do check it out. Ron, we should say, though, so far, so good. In fact, they tell us here that earlier today, he was going more than 100 miles an hour. Wow, that's up from 20 miles an hour. I know. Okay. So, uh, not bad. Thanks a lot. That's sure. Ann State reporting live at Washington University at Mission Control. Ocean. He's reportedly picking up speed, traveling 86 miles per hour. 
This vast stretch over the Atlantic is the most dangerous for the explorer. And, of course, you can check his position anytime you like at our website. That's KMOV.com. But he's making good progress. He is. As we said, over a dangerous part over that much ocean. At this time, Fawcett facing no major obstacles. That's unlike his other five attempts. Sure Mike O'Connell joining us live at Mission Control at Washington University, tracking Fawcett's progress. Mike, he is over dangerous waters, of course, at this point. Yeah, a lot of water ahead of him right now. Steve Fawcett's sixth solo attempt to circumnavigate the globe is now just entering its 10th day, and he is traveling at a rate that is 30% faster than he did on his most recent attempt, which, of course, was just last year. Early this morning, he passed the 9,773 mile mark. That is halfway around the globe. The Chicago millionaire adventurer passed the southern tip of South America, and he now has nothing but liquid real estate between him and his goal, Western Australia, where the trip started, of course. Fawcett is now heading eastward over the Atlantic at about 80 miles an hour, his altitude 24,000 feet, and he is sounding very upbeat. The weather routing has been excellent. Uh, so I've uh, reach, I'm reaching the South American coast in uh, uh, just uh, eight days. It took me 11 and a half days last year. Uh, so it's, uh, it's going good and uh, the outlook is good. I may be flying fast uh, for the rest of the trip. Now the mood here at Washington University Mission Control is very upbeat, saying so far this is clearly Fawcett's most trouble-free journey and if you would like to monitor the progress aboard the Spirit of Freedom, go to our website, that is KMOV.com. We will provide you with all the latest information on the website, KMOV.com. Check it out. As of now, Mission Control still predicting that he will land in Western Australia on July 2nd. Now let's go to Kent, and he will give us a little look at what he's got ahead of him. Kent? Mike, they are looking pretty upbeat there at Mission Control at Washington University, but I know these are some long days for those folks, and they're doing a great job. Take a look at the, the map that we've put together for you here with the help of uh, meteorologist Joe Petrovich. There is the position of the balloon at the last check, and as Mike said, the flight level right now, they're telling us about 24,000 200 feet, moving along at around 78 miles per hour. He's 11,257 miles into the mission, which is just about 61%. These are the winds at flight level, and these contours indicate the strongest winds, or you could even call it a little bit of a jet stream. And boy, he really went through one here. Now you're going to see him turn to the north uh, just a little bit. The winds may weaken just a tad, but he's still in some pretty good winds out here at, at 24,000 feet, and likely he'll probably stay at about that altitude. A couple of things to remember. He's in the southern hemisphere. Here's the southern tip of South America, and you can see Antarctica down here. And another thing to remember is it's cold. It's the southern hemisphere winter down there, and temperatures at that altitude at any time of year are cold, but certainly those waters are very frigid as well. Excellent. Uh, so I've, uh, reach, I'm reaching the South American coast in uh, uh, just uh, eight days. It took me 11 and a half days last year. Uh, so it's, uh, it's going good, and uh, the outlook is good. I may be flying fast uh, for the rest of the trip. Fawcett is headed for Western Australia, where he set out from 10 days ago. He may see no more land until he hits Australia, unless for weather purposes he has to pass briefly over the Cape of Good Hope. He's doing extremely well compared to last year this time. Barry Tobias, you're following him. Give us an idea of where Steve is right now. Uh, Steve's, in the, as you said, in the South Atlantic. He's pretty much right south of England. In fact, he's in the same time zone as Greenwich Mean Time. Um, and he's pretty much halfway about the Atlantic, heading about 65 miles an hour and heading straight for Cape Town. Now, last year this time, he ran into a lot of strong winds and he had a lot of problems. None of that so far. Well, we've had some adventures, um, but we've been able to uh, maneuver around the winds. Uh, we've dropped down to 900 feet off the waves if need be, but we've got around them. And uh, there's one more s possible system we're looking at, but other than that, it's smooth sailing. Folks who are watching this guy in his balloon, what are some of the necessary items he, he has up there with him? I hear it's really chilly. Yeah, it is. It's about negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit outside. Um, he's got a heater inside, though. Keeps about 20, uh, I mean, Fahrenheit, about uh, 60 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, he's got his food that's uh, not quite tasty, but, you know, it gets him what he needs and, um, and a lot of water. When was the last time you talked to him? Uh, we actually, he ca uh, we talked to him earlier this morning. Um, he was kind of excited to get going across the Atlantic and things were going well. And he was kind of in a joking mood and very exciting and everything. 
Not tired at all. Well, that's a given. I mean, he's, <laughs> he's exhausted after the last couple of days, but uh, he's ready to uh, make it to Australia. Looks like he's going to be able to do it, you think? 70%? Uh, yeah, we just passed the 66% line about 10 minutes ago. And um, as we said, there's a, there's a possible storm that we're looking at that will maneuver around, um, around South Africa. But other than that, we're uh, crossing our fingers. All right, we are definitely. Barry, thanks a lot. 70% done, Mark and Ann. He's 27,000 feet in the air. We're going to have much more. In fact, we're going to actually hear from the balloonist coming up in the next half hour. Stick around. Oh, All right. okay. He's cruising. He is. We wish him luck. Thank you. Robert Townsend, live over at Washington University. Millionaire Steve Fawcett is soaring over the South Atlantic. He is more than halfway around the world. Robert Townsend joins us live right now from Mission Control at Washington University, where Fawcett followers are crossing their fingers. Hi, and hi there. At this very minute, Steve Fawcett, they tell us he's 27,000 feet in the air, still cruising over the Atlantic in his balloon. He tells us he's feeling very upbeat, very confident about his sixth attempt, sixth attempt around the world solo in his balloon. The weather routing has been excellent. Uh, so I've uh, reach, I'm reaching the South American coast in uh, uh, just uh, eight days. It took me 11 and a half days last year. Uh, so it's, uh, it's going good, and uh, the outlook is good. I may be flying fast uh, for the rest of the trip. Now, the folks here at Mission Control have been following Foss's trip around the clock. Jared Mackey, you're one of them. Give us an idea of how you guys communicate with Steve. Well, regularly we receive position reports from him uh, via fax. Uh, occasionally we'll email with him or receive calls from him, usually just to check in and say he's doing fine and wondering how we're doing. Um, yeah. Occasionally we receive multimedia like you're looking at now and uh, the sound clip you heard earlier. Those we receive from a chase plane that follows Steve around the world. Uh, this is a picture of him taken earlier. Uh, actually, this is over the Pacific. These are pretty cool pictures from cyberspace. Mm -hmm. You can download these at our website. Now, when you talk about, uh, you guys are keep saying that he's doing far better than he was doing last year. Are you surprised by that? Uh, not really. This is the best prepared we've been. Uh, we've had excellent forecasting. And uh, I'd like to think that all the other previous missions have given us the experience for this. No problems at all so far? Uh, the occasional uh, routine maintenance, but nothing that could stop the mission. Now I hear you guys are get, receiving phone calls from around the world. Yeah, we get uh, really uh, interested people, uh, news, media, people who just want to call in and say they're supporting him. All right, Jared, thanks a lot. No Mark and Andy, he's a Chicago millionaire, 58 years old, married, an adventurer for sure. Definitely just trying to become this uh, first person to travel the world in a balloon. Let's cross our fingers. He sure, surely will make it this time. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I know a lot of people want him to finish because they're kind of sick of hearing about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But thank I, I do you. hope he makes it. We do, indeed. Thank you, Robert sure. Townsend. They've been busy around the clock. David. Perlman, you're one of those guys. Give me an idea as to uh, how many folks make up Mission Control. Well, about 50 people make up Mission Control. We have about 18 entrants from Washington University. We also have about six or seven people from the Steve Fawcett team and Mission Control. And we have about about 20 or 25 people that are also Washington University staff and about and the rest of staff from Bud Light. Tell us more about the dynamics behind Mission well, Control. In this room, we have the, uh, a huge, a large map that, uh, that we track Steve Fawcett on. And then um, over in this corner over here, we have the web team and the video actualities. And what do they do? Oh, well, the web team um, helps communicate what we, the Steve Foster trip to the rest of the public and throughout the uh, world. And down here? And down here, we have Mission Control. And Mission Control is actually made up of uh, several components. We have uh, two air traffic coordinators that help, um, that help get flight clearance as he goes over different countries. We also have two meteorologists. And we have a uh, flight director and, uh, and a project manager. People all over the world are following Fawcett. Yes, they are. It's, it's quite amazing. We get phone calls from Australia almost every morning because we're open 24 hours a day. And, you know, in Australia, it's, it's morning when, I mean, it's afternoon when it, we're morning. And uh, it's, they always want to do interviews. And we've had phone calls from Poland and Germany and um, places all over. And today we had a phone call from Colorado and we did an interview with them. And, so it's quite amazing, the interest on this um, balloon trip. And yeah. a lot of, we also have a lot of uh, balloon enthusiasts. <laughs> and they, they come in here and they, they hang out and they try to watch what's happening. And yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just I, I didn't know that there was so much interest in ballooning. Yeah, until it fascinating. Here. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Now, Mark and Ann, if all goes according to plan, cross your fingers. They, uh, faucets should be completed uh, by July 2nd, just Ooh, next wow. Tuesday. Yeah. Kevin Stas, you're one of the followers here at Mission Control. We hear that the wind is working in his favor. 
Yeah, at the moment he's uh, chucking along at about 60 knots and heading in a northeasterly direction towards um, Cape Town. And that's why he's doing so well? Uh, yeah, the meteorologists have looked at the, uh, the predictions and he's doing a very good speed at the moment and hopefully he'll be over South Africa tomorrow. How would you compare this ride compared to last year's? Oh, this ride is a lot better. Um, we've now crossed South America. Um, we're out in the South Atlantic, and he's really doing well. What did he pack for the trip? Uh, well, he's got all sorts of things. He's got a computer. I think he's got a book, although I don't know which book it is. Um, he's got his dried food, which they use, the military use. Um, I hope he's got his passport. <laughs> and, um, yeah, that's, that's about it, really. I hear a storm is brewing over South Africa. Yeah, they're, they're looking at it at the moment. We don't think at the moment it's going to cause uh, many problems. Um, hopefully not. He'll, he should swing sort of around the coast of South Africa and then uh, off to Australia, so he'll probably miss all that. All right, Kevin, thanks. We wish him well. The folks here are definitely upbeat. Equally so, Steve Fawcett says, hey, look, if everything goes according to plan, he should wrap up his historic ride next Tuesday, July 2nd. Mark it in, cross your fingers can keep track of his trip. This is a live report right now by logging on to KMOV.com. We'll switch you to his site where you can see exactly where he is. The sixth time might be the charm for Steve Fawcett in his quest to fly solo around the world in a balloon. If he makes it, he'll be the first person to do so. After taking off from Australia on June 19th, Fawcett has traveled more than two-thirds of the way around the world in a hot air balloon he calls the Spirit of Freedom. The Chicago investment tycoon hopes to complete the non-stop trip in 15 days. Joe Ritchie is the mission control director for the flight. He's in control headquarters at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. Sir, thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Yeah, good morning, Russ. How is the trip going so far? Actually, it's going very well. Uh, this has been the most relaxed and uh, smooth flight we've had. There have been a few incidents where we've had to do some bobbing and weaving to dodge some bad weather, but overall, uh, it's going well, and Steve, uh, in addition to being almost three-quarters of the way, I think is in very high spirits and reasonably rested. <laughs> That's good news. You talked about some, some bobbing and weaving. I understand you had to slow down a bit to avoid some rough weather. What is the weather forecast for the next few days? Yeah. Well, it's, there's, there's a heavy thunderstorm out ahead, and instead of just kind of running right at it and trying to go over the top, the... Uh, Luke and David, the weather guys, have decided that a little bit of a stutter step here where we... Uh, we we slow down our speed, let the thunderstorm kind yeah. of move on in front of us, and then and then come in behind and go around. It looks the best. So uh, it's reasonable weather where he at where he's at. There are clouds below him, but he's staying he's staying just barely above them and trying to go slow enough to let the the thunderstorm ahead get out of the I way. I understand. Would you say the trip is going ahead of schedule at this point? Uh, actually. It's, it's uh, a hair behind the original projections, uh -huh. but the original projections were unbelievably fast. Now, you say things are going pretty smoothly at this point. Do you ever sit there and go, you know what, this is going too smoothly. We don't want to jinx it. Does any thought like that ever enter your mind? <laughs> yes. Well, before we left, the, the projected wind patterns were so good that we couldn't believe they would, that it would actually work that well. Uh, so you try not to talk about it, but... Uh, but you, you just get up there and, and uh, head forward and see how it goes. Okay, I gotta ask you this. Is it too early, too early to talk about a celebration or have you already thought about what you're gonna do if Mr. Fawcett does cross the finish line? Yeah. You know, th uh, there's all kinds of people thinking about that. We try not to talk about it because like you say, you, you just feel like if you start thinking that way, then, uh, then something's gonna go wrong. So you try <laughs> to focus on the very next day and the weather maybe two days out and don't even think about the celebration. And I know your team at Mission Control has been working around the clock. How you guys holding up? We're, we're doing fine. Uh, it's been, you know, again, just having a, <clears throat> when you're not fighting fires constantly, it really helps. So we've had a few, but, but it hasn't been well, wall to wall, back to back like it has been in the past. Okay, Joe Ritchie in St. Louis, Missouri. Good luck to you and Steve Fossey. We hope to talk to you next week. Thanks, Russ. You take care, sir. Millionaire Steve Fawcett is closer than he has ever been at circling the world in a balloon. But the question tonight is whether or not Fawcett's flight will count in the record books if he can complete the journey. Ryan Newsbickle has the latest on this rule technicality from our newsroom. Ryan? Well, Matt, it's a complicated technicality, and some are saying it could be difficult to determine if Fawcett's flight will count 
until it's over. The controversy began yesterday when the Washington University oh, grad wow. dipped his balloons south toward Antarctica ah. to avoid a storm system in the Atlantic Ocean. That's raised some questions that perhaps the 58-year-old balloonist went too far south for his trip around the world to be considered valid. But members of Mission Control at Washington University say the worldwide ballooning rules governing the flight allowed for Fawcett's move. They say his trip will count because Fawcett had more than compensated, compensated for heading that far south when he began his flight. Where we dip below on the other side is approximately where we launched from in Australia, at which point we we're about 20 degrees north of where that minimum line is. And so we dropped down two degrees, but on the other side we're 20 degrees over. So, you know, a little shift of it, um, it's not a problem at all. We're well outside of that. And meanwhile, Fawcett is nearing Africa tonight, which is further than he's ever gone before in any of the six attempts to circle the world in a balloon. Now, you can follow his progress on our website, KMOV.com. Matt, back to you. Nearing Africa, and he has to get to Australia to complete uh, the globe. Is that right? That's right. He's got to cross the Indian Ocean. That's his final stretch, so to speak. All right. Thanks, Ryan Newsbickle, reporting in the newsroom. Yeah, in one sense, it's very difficult. I mean, it's a, it's a big ocean, and it depends on a very specific weather pattern to make it across. But on the other hand, uh, that's what we've done over two, uh, two prior oceans. Uh, managed to follow a very specific weather pattern and made it across. Fawcett is now in his 12th day of flight aboard the Bud Light Spirit of Freedom, traveling along at 75 miles an hour. He hopes to complete his journey in just over three days. I know we've said it before. We all hope he does it, too, because we don't want to talk about a seventh attempt. <laughs> I think you're right. Steve Fawcett is four-fifths of the way through his journey to circle the world in a balloon. Fox 2's Veronica Griffin is live at Fawcett's Mission Control at Washington University. Veronica? Margie, it's getting close to the final countdown at Mission Control here at Wash U. At this point, we're told millionaire balloonist Steve Fawcett is 79% of the way on his journey around the world. From the start of his launch in Australia, there have been some minor bumps in the road, so to speak, but for the most part, it's been smooth sailing. Right now, Fawcett is just east of the coast of South Africa. Fawcett has traveled some 15,000 miles at this point, and we're told he's traveling at 140 miles per hour and picking up speed, breaking his speed record of 138 miles per hour. He hopes to be the first man to travel solo around the world in a balloon. Well, he's feeling terrific. He's pretty confident. Uh, so far, everything went smoothly, or mostly smoothly. And uh, because we have gotten so far already, he's very confident. His health is, is uh, good. His, his mental health is also very positive. So we think he has a very good shot at it. There's a, a very good opportunity that uh, I'll complete this. Um, but before I start feeling confident, I think I'll um, want to be turning the corner and uh, crossing the uh, finish line. That was Steve Fawcett talking to his crew from over the Indian Ocean. Now, back here live at Mission Control, we're told he should land around 6 a.m. St. Louis time on Tuesday in Western Australia. Back to you. In January, back in 1997. Well, this morning he's on the verge, about to, oh, 300 miles away or so from completing that journey. Let's give you a look at what's going on at Mission Control this morning, maybe early in the morning. Uh, but there are a lot of folks that have been hard at work here this morning, plotting this course, trying to ensure the success of Steve Fawcett's very latest effort. Uh, the biggest uh, issue right now is exactly where he's going to land. They tell me, as uh, we begin to, you can see them plotting on the map down there right now, as we uh, take a look at some of the most recent video of Fawcett's balloon, the Solo Spirit. They tell me he is a little less than, uh, oh, 300 miles west of the record-setting mark. That would be the launch point, which was near uh, Northam, Australia. Uh, where he will land is still very much up in the air. We're told this morning uh, that uh, what they were thinking yesterday around Kalgoorlie is probably not going to happen today. They think he's going to end up a little further to the south of that, and uh, they would like to bring him in at around... Oh, 9 a.m. this morning, St. Louis time, which would be right around a dawn where he's going to be there in Australia. So that's still very much up in the air. But at this point, it looks very much like his success is almost ensured. He is right, almost assured, I should say. He is right there on the verge of crossing that line where he will set the record for the solo around the world flight. And we have a lot of people down here, uh, air traffic controllers, specialists, meteorologists, keeping an eye on air patterns. But to make this whole operation run a mission control, there are also a lot of students who work over here. Ryan Newsbickle has been uh, talking to one of those students this morning, finding out uh, the long hours they've been putting in out here. Well, I tell you what, Mark, it's so interesting because Steve Fawcett really depends upon a lot of people, and a lot of those people include students here at Washington University to ensure his success. We're talking here 
with Aaron Hickey, who's a junior. Aaron, you pretty much camp out over in the uh, Web Center, so you're sending out a lot of the, the daily reports or, or even the hourly reports exactly. on this. Exactly. Um, we write reports every two hours, 12-hour updates, and we just post the latest information that we get through the meteorologists and air traffic controls to say where Steve's heading. What's it like spending your summers working on something like this? I mean, uh, I think back in my college days, I was loafing around as a lifeguard. <laughs> it's pretty interesting. Um, it's, it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Uh, it's a cool website to work for, and it's just really neat to be a part of this event. Okay, thank you very much. No Appreciate problem. it. It's very interesting, uh, particularly with a lot of the students. I mean, and these are students that we rely on, too, to get our updates as well on Steve Fawcett's, uh, which looks to be an imminent success on this particular trip, his uh, sixth bid to try and encircle the globe. Mark, uh, how did you spend your summers in college? Boy, let me think. On the beach? Uh, yeah. This would be exciting, wouldn't this, it? This would be. You bet. I'll tell you what, the parents would like that. All right. Yeah, they would. All right, Ryan, you. thank you. I think people probably don't realize just how big a deal this is, but Steve Fawcett, by having his mission control here in St. Louis, is really getting a worldwide attention focused on it. If you can see the sea of cameras down here, I think uh, all of the networks are going to be represented here this morning. Uh, they're going to be doing interviews as Steve Fawcett nears that record, which should happen again. Uh, just about four hours from now, they're telling me, say, 9 or 9.30 this morning, St. Louis time. We're going to be live here at Mission Control following all the latest. We'll bring that to you as it develops. And back to you. Okay. Can't wait. Mark Cox, flag I'll watch you. And thanks to Ryan Newsbickel as well. I'll check in with you later. It is expected to cross the so-called finish line high above the Indian Ocean. We asked Mission Control directors here at Washington University, then what? Well, at that point, uh, we start looking at, uh, as it gets closer, where he's going to come into Australia. Um, and then we'll, we'll start looking at uh, uh, weather conditions uh, at time of landing and also conditions of the area that he's going to be coming in and landing. And Fawcett is expected to be on the ground uh, sometime in Australia later tonight or early tomorrow morning. Perhaps then he can return to his former career, either swimming the English Channel or perhaps racing dogs in the Iditara Iditarod dog sled race or perhaps cars in the 24 hours of Le Mans. That is your resume when you are a millionaire adventurer. Reporting live this morning in St. Louis, Alex Fees, News Channel 5. Alex, I'm sure the millionaire adventurer can uh, spring for a pretty big party, too, don't you think? I would think so. I think St. Louis would be a good place for that. All right, Alex, thank you very much. <laughs> that balloonist, he's up there, isn't he? <laughs> very good, Corey. I'll take it from here. Balloonist Steve Fawcett is just hours away, actually, from becoming the first solo balloonist to circle the globe. We've got live team coverage. Let's go now to Mark Cox at Mission Control at Washington University. He's got the latest. Hi, Mark. Good morning to you, Anna. I wasn't worth sure where Corey was going there for a minute, but <laughs> I am high above Mission Control this morning. As maybe you can look over my shoulder here. We can get uh, photojournalist Britt Reese to get a shot down at Mission Control. And there's a lot of activity down there this morning as they're trying to plot Steve Fawcett's successful completion of... What's the very latest on Steve's position? Uh, right now, Steve and the Bud Light Spit of Freedom are about two to three degrees away from the finish line, and so it's about two more hours to go if everything keeps going as it has been. Well, that's about 200 miles, right? That's correct, yes. Roughly? Yeah, about, uh, I believe the last I looked was about 175, and that was about 10, 20 minutes ago. Now, he's still flying pretty high. It's a situation where it's pretty cold up there, I imagine, having to use oxygen, that sort of thing? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, right now he's about 23,000 feet, um, so he'll still be breathing oxygen constantly. Um, it's cold outside, but he's got a good cabin heater inside. So, hmm. And I know there are going to be celebrations at 8.30 probably when this happens, but realistically, uh, he's not out of the woods till that thing lands safely. And when are we looking at that possibly happening? Um, well, landfall doesn't happen until tonight sometime, St. Louis time. And then after that, we'll start looking to, to a good time for him to land and a good place for him to land. So uh, it's, it's about another 24 hours, I'd say, and then we're finally out of the woods. Wow. All right. Barry Tobias, thank you very much. Uh, good job down there. I know this is a very second year here working on the crew. But, you know, over the years, uh, to get to this point, to get this close to success, Steve Fawcett has had some close calls. Ryan Newsbickle joining us now with a little closer look at probably maybe his closest call through that, the years. That's right, Mark. It was his third flight, and this is the one where he took off out of Mendoza, Argentina, possibly his most turbulent flight. Case in point, six hours after launching from Mendoza, Argentina, Fawcett had a fire outside his cabin. These are the good times today, and Mark, I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to be sort of the harbinger of bad news, or I don't want to jinx them, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, knock on some wood here so we're, <laughs> we don't jinx them this time. But, but as we point. were just talking with, Perry, with Barry, though, they've got two more hours to go roughly this morning. 
they're feeling pretty good. Oh, I can you imagine how excited Steve Fawcett must be right now? Absolutely. Maybe two hours from his goal. He's keeping in close contact with folks here at Mission Control at Washington University. In fact, much of the coverage in the U.S., we're getting national, maybe even international coverage this morning. People, uh, TV stations, radio stations from Australia calling in here to Washington University to find out the very latest on where Steve Fawcett is and when and where he might land. Landing at 9 o'clock tonight? Not, not necessarily landing, but crossing over the coast. And then the decision will be made at that point whether he's going to land or continue on and land in his sunset. Okay, Bert, what went differently this time, the sixth attempt? Uh, good good uh, meteorology uh, service, uh, luck with the weather uh, to a certain extent, and uh, very good equipment. All right, good deal, Bert. Congra uh, congratulations, I guess. Uh, cautious optimism at this point, huh? Well, it'll be congratulations, hopefully, by 9 o'clock. All right, continued success. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate you being here with us this morning. Now, on Sunday, Fawcett actually broke his own record for distance traveled by a solo balloonist. You will remember that in 1998, his balloon plunged 20, 29,000 feet into the Coral Sea. They are certainly hoping and have reason to expect a different result this time. Reporting live this morning in St. Louis, Alex Fees, News Channel 5. To find out more about Steve Fawcett's mission and his attempt uh, to complete this world record that he started out trying to set, oh, about five years ago. You remember his first attempts from down there at Bush Stadium. They have been speaking to Steve Fawcett lately because the question right now is where will he land the Freedom uh, Spirit balloon? And Ryan Newsbickle is going to talk to somebody right now who may be able to update us on that, right? Well, Mark, it's the final obstacle right now for Steve Fawcett is sort of how to touch down. He doesn't want to land in the water is what we're hearing. And uh, Jim Mitchell is uh, from Mission Control, and uh, Steve Fawcett just talked with you guys a few hours ago. What were some of his concerns about the landing? Well, the first thing he is he wanted to ask about where the landing or where the uh, finish line was exactly. Uh, that's his first goal, and that's a couple of hours away. That's at a roughly 117 east longitude and uh, but then the next question he asked was uh, about landing conditions he, uh, the wind to some extent but more a matter of we have rocks trees mm -hmm. sandy soil and that sort of thing so he's he's got his priorities lined out to get the record finish the across the uh, the proper uh, longitude line. 1998, 14,000 miles. Thunderstorms ripped his balloon. He plunged 29,000 feet into the sea. August 2001, a solo duration record, but no joy. His trip ended in beige Brazil, where bad weather and low oxygen supply forced him to quit. And joining us now from Mission Control in St. Louis is Kevin Stass, the Air Traffic Control Coordinator for the project. Mr. Stass, thanks so much for being with us. Good morning, Diane. Good morning. So I know you can talk to him through email and cell phone. What is he saying? Well, his spirits are really good at the moment. Uh, he's really looking forward to, to landing. Uh, he should be crossing the uh, 117 morning, East line. Um, around about two and a quarter hours from now. So he's uh, upbeat and getting ready to land the balloon. How hard has it been? How cold? How hard to breathe? Well, it's, sometimes it's been pretty cold. He's been down with the icebergs and the penguins. Um, yeah. And uh, he's been having to use his oxygen mask quite a lot. So, um, yeah, he's had a pretty rough time. So I think he's looking forward to landing. And one of the keys to the success, I gather, has been good meteorology, showing him how to to go high and low and avoid some yeah. of the worst of the weather. But how did he make it through those storms over the Pacific? Well, um, we've got two really good meteorologists working on this project. Um, there's Luke and David who have been doing a fantastic job. Um, they've been steering Steve around all the bad weather. They've been telling him to go to various flight levels. He's been up to 34,000 feet. He's been down to, well, almost fishing level uh, over the Pacific. So um, they've been steering him quite well. Do you think he'll make a wet landing or is he actually going to get to the coast and on land with this route? No, no, he's going to get on the coast, uh, over the coast and on land. So um, we're hoping that because we want the, uh, the capsule to be hung in the Smithsonian. So, <laughs> and, it's, and, it, and it's got my name on it, so he can't put it in the sea. <laughs> oh, well, then, then it's vitally important. If it he is, landed very. in water, would it still be the record? Oh, yeah, it would still be the record as long as he goes past the, the 117 East. Well, in fact, it's just slightly before that, but that's the, that's the finish line that we're looking at. And that's in about two and a quarter hours' time. And does he have a bottle of champagne on board, and how are you all going to celebrate? 
Uh, we're going to have a, a, a big party. Um, I think he's probably got something on board that he can uh, have while he's waiting for the rescue helicopters and trucks and all the sorts of other things that are going to come and meet him. Well, it is a phenomenal achievement, and the sixth time seems to be the charm. We congratulate all of you. It seems to be in order this morning. Okay, thanks very much, Diane. And good to have you with us, Charlie. Great. I know that you have had great weather for this adventure this time around. Is that why you believe it's going to be a successful mission, or are there other factors as well? Well, the main reason we've had good weather is because we've done a terrific job steering around bad weather. Uh, uh, Luke and David, the, from, from the Royal Meteorological Society of Belgium, have done the weather this time, and they've, they've just done a marvelous job of looking way downstream, seeing the bad weather coming, and maneuvering early to get around it rather than waiting till the last minute. So I think the weather in general has been average, but the steering job has been absolutely magnificent. Now, I understand that Steve will actually complete this around-the-world mission while he's still over water later on this morning. So when actually will he touch down on land then? I think it'll be uh, another... 12 hours or so before he blows far enough north to get over the southern Australian coast. We know that uh, Steve Fawcett is a millionaire, but that doesn't necessarily always equate with motivation. What do you think has kept him going for six tries at this? You know, the, Steve's an amazing example of, of the, if you know, the, uh, the first succeed, try again and again and again and again. Uh, he just has, has a cheerful, gentle persistence that won't quit. I've never known a guy quite like this, and uh, it doesn't matter if the press is watching or not. He's, most of his achievements, nobody was ever watching, but he just he enjoys uh, setting a, a goal and, and just sticking with it until he does it, and, and the guy just doesn't quit. Well, he must have that no-quit attitude because I know he's been in a closet-sized capsule now for two weeks. Can you give us a sense of what it's been like for him to live in these close quarters? Well, it's, it's, you know, you're in solitary confinement. Of course, Steve's used to it. He's done sailing deals around the world solo. He's, he's sort of a, a solo kind of guy. Right. And uh, so, so, you know, this is something he's used to, he's done before. And can you give us a sense of how your team at Mission Control played into this whole thing? I know he's flying the balloon, but you guys are an integral and important part of this mission as well. Well, the problem is sitting up in a balloon, you're blind. I mean, you, you don't have a clue where you are or a clue where you're going or a clue where the weather is. So, so you, have, uh, you have the weather guys that have to steer you and you're totally dependent on them. And then you have the guys who are experts on the balloon equipment, the, the communication system, the burners, uh, the, the solenoids, the fuel systems and everything that can go wrong and have to kind of talk you through repairs right. that you inevitably have to make well, during the flight. Mission accomplished, Joe Ritchie. Congratulations to you and to Steve Fawcett. Thanks, Gretchen. Ms. Bickle right now joining us with more on that story and exactly uh, where Steve is positioned at this hour. Exactly, Mark. I mean, it's, uh, it's a situation where we've been talking about. The landing is the big issue right now. Is What is also an issue is when, in fact, Steve Fawcett will break this world record, when he will be the first so solo balloonist to encircle the globe. Here to talk about that is Kevin Stas, who is the air traffic coordinator. Kevin, uh, what, what are the big issues right now for you? Well, the big issues are obviously um, Steve crossing the line, which we reckon is going to be in about um, an hour's time, I guess. Um, you know, he's really looking forward to it. He's exhausted, and I think he just wants to land as quickly as possible. We had mentioned before earlier this morning, he doesn't want to make a water landing. What are ideal landing conditions for, for Steve? What does he want to do? Well, ideal landing conditions, I guess, the surface winds probably below five knots. Um, he's got to be careful about landing during the, the daylight hours with the thermal activity, uh, especially in that part of the world. So uh, the meteorologists are sort of looking at a strategy of getting him to land. So this is the problem at the moment. People keep saying, when's he going to land? When's he going to land? But they're, they're, they're all talking together, and we're going to come up with some answer probably in the next few hours. I guess an ideal landing surface would be something soft. Uh, yeah, something soft, nice bit of sand, you know, nothing too rocky, okay. yeah. All right. No, you're not going to have any feather stuffed pillows or anything ready for him? Uh, no, no, I mean, he probably, as long as he doesn't land on a dingo or kill a few wallabies or something, we'll be all right. <laughs> Don't think that's going to happen, but we'll stay tuned. Thank you very much, Kevin Stas. Okay. Mark, what can we say? Dingoes, wallabies, and Steve Fawcett, you they're know. all there. All the characters are there, and it's... Uh, Certainly, it's uh, fi five years in the making, but it's finally going to happen, he's, looks like. He's got it within reach now. We're going to be standing by live here at Mission Control at Washington University to bring you up to date 
the minute that happens, a lot of excitement over here right now, I can tell you that. And back to you. How far away is he? How fast is he traveling? Give me the specifics. He's uh, 55, 60 miles an hour and about two and a half hours away from the finish line, that is, not from land. He'll finish over the water, and then it'll take another 12 hours or so to blow north up over the land. When's the last time you spoke to him, and how's he feeling? Spoke to him <clears throat> late last night. He was, he was utterly exhausted. He just spent a long day at 35,000 feet where he has to wear an uh, emergency oxygen mask to get over some, uh, some kind of nasty turbulence that had him pretty well shook up. And uh, so, so there, there comes a point when it's kind of like the sl ex sleep deprivation experiments they do where, where you just, uh, it starts to affect you. And that's how he, uh, but he, then he got a couple hours sleep, so I think he's in a lot better shape now, but he's eager to get down. Joe, just remind me, and for people who, who may not remember this, how does this compare to his best efforts in the past? Where he is today versus what he's accomplished in the past? Well, this is, this is far better. Uh, one time he made it about halfway, and one time a little over 60% of the way. But, but this time he's not only made it all the way, but he's got enough fuel he could go on to South America if he, if, if he was up for it, but I don't think he is. How much of a success of a mission like this, Joe, is, is reliant on technical knowledge, and how much is just plain, I hate to put it this way, dumb luck? Actually, this is one of those deals where if, you're, if, you're, if you do it right, you wind up looking lucky. Uh, the weather looks luckier this time, but actually there was, there, uh, there was some new methodology brought to bear at avoiding the bad weather, so right. it makes it look lucky. But in fact, the weather was about the same, and, and the meteorologists on this, you know, for the Bud Light Spirit of Freedom flight have just looked way downstream and anticipated that two or three days ahead of time and started dodging early, even though they had to sacrifice speed to do it. So, uh, there's uh, any time you're dealing with weather, there's some dumb luck. But, but one of these executed correctly should make it around the world, I think, right. two-thirds of the time. All right, Joe. Well, listen, we have our fingers on the bottle. We won't pop the corks just yet, but, but good luck. We'll keep our fingers crossed. Thanks, Matt. Need to watch. But we'll watch this in the next hour, Paul, and let you know, as perhaps you can see back there, mission control is humming. Jeff, back obviously, the other thing that separates him from anybody else who might try this is his bank account. He has the funds that allow him to support these kind of adventures. Do we have any idea what he has spent over the years to try to meet this goal? He has steadfastly refused to answer that question. He's made a lot of money uh, in the futures trading pits in Chicago, but this time, interesting to note that for the first time, he, he got some sponsorship, and that is from the folks at Budweiser. They're trying to keep a low profile here, but they have helped bankroll this because even with all the money he made uh, trading futures in Chicago, this is just an enormous undertaking. Just how enormous, though, we don't know. Well, maybe if he succeeds, he'll finally share those numbers with us. We wish him luck. I, I actually personally <laughs> hope he makes that goal. I think he thinks it's worth it, regardless. All right, thanks, Jeff. We'll uh, check in with you the next hour and see if it happens. Uh, we're going to now move on to the weather. Chad Meyer standing by in Atlanta with the latest forecast. Uh, Mr. Fawcett yesterday complaining uh, about the food after so <laughs> yeah. many days yeah, in the exactly. air. I guess that shouldn't come any, as any great <laughs> surprise to him, right? You know, I guess you go out and you buy the box of granola bars, and there's three chocolate, three banana, and, you know, like seven chocolate chip. And now he's eating all the chocolate chips, and he's down to the banana or something, you know? Yeah, you exactly. you got to have to plan for that. I have a map behind me, Paula, of where he's been, where he's going, and where he is right now. Here's where he started. At 117 degrees east, the wind blew him to the west like it does in the United States. Winds blow in the jet stream where we are from west to east. So he's going from west to east off this side of the map, then back on this side of the map, right over southern South America. A little dip toward Antarctica here. That couldn't have been very warm. Then back up to Africa. And now the problem that Jeff was talking about, he's just this much south of Australia should have picked a bigger place to land because if he does drift a little bit farther to the south, he's going to miss Australia. The good news right now, he's still at 27,000 feet and he is flying a little bit to the north of east, so it should take him into parts of Australia later today. He's 100 miles from making the journey right now and he's still 27,000 feet up in the sky, so that's some good. Bumps in the road. Fawcett has tried on five other occasions to go around the world, but each time he's run into problems. A street that it is apparently about to end. Equipment has improved uh, considerably. Um, the team that has uh, uh, been involved in the other attempts have held together throughout the attempts, and uh, 
have really come together this, this time around and really focused on, on what's happening uh, more so than I feel in the other attempts. And uh, a big, big uh, contribution in the meteorology department with uh, uh, Luke Trollman. Photographer Ricky Davis is showing you the beehive of activity that's happening right, ne right now at Mission Control. They are getting ready to schedule a news conference for 8.30 where they will give us an update on Steve uh, Fawcett's progress and being the first man ever to circle the globe. Kevin? I tell you what, John, we can definitely tell a difference in just the buzz from where you're standing. Things are really heating up there. They're getting ready to, ready to do it, aren't they? Yes, they are, and I've kind of perked up a little bit, too, Kevin. <laughs> All right, John Gadsden live at Mission Control. We'll check back with John just as soon as it happens. Of course, they're looking for ideal conditions in which to bring this balloon down, because even if uh, he successfully breaks the record, if they don't bring him down to Earth safely, then the trip is something less than a success for Steve Fawcett. So his concern is their primary uh, concern. His safety is their primary concern right now. We're waiting for the news conference. We think at about 8.38, Steve may have that record in hand. Back to you. All Center in St. Louis. Jeff, will he make it? Oh, I think so, Paul. I tell you what, I'd like to have a hot air balloon right now. Maybe we could get up and uh, up a little higher than where we are right now. Maybe you could see us a little bit better, but perhaps you can see the crush. This is a pretty good indication that they're very close, although it does appear that it's going to be a little later than we first thought. Maybe uh, we thought 8.30 local time, that's 9.30 Eastern, and now it looks more like maybe 9.40 or so. Perhaps you see the guys down there. I don't know if you're able to see, but uh, uh, Kevin Stass, who is the... Uh, uh, an employee of Richard Branson's who works now with uh, Steve Fawcett, who was working air traffic control. They're, they're looking where he's going to cross the line. And of course, when he crosses the line, it's kind of a, you know, an imaginary line out there, the 117th parallel. And so <laughs> there's no uh, printed uh, finish line on the ocean there. So that it'll be, uh, you know, a little bit anticlimactic perhaps, but uh, the other guy, the other thing they got to worry about here is that they also got to get him down safely. So I don't think you're going to see big celebrations with p champagne corks popping. But uh, uh, clearly, they're pretty happy about what they've achieved thus far. You know, I was just looking uh, uh, in the last hour at what Steve Fawcett has already accomplished, which is five solo around the world attempts, the longest solo flight already, the longest duration already, the first balloon crossings of Asia, Africa, Europe, South America. He is really no stranger to achievement with a balloon, but this is the one that really took the time, uh, as we said, five earlier attempts, all of them, you know, disappointing. And I don't know, Bill, if you're able to see, I don't know if you can see uh, Bert Padelt, who's now, he's the guy with the blonde, uh, with the uh, bald head. I don't know if you're able to see him, Bill. He has been on with Steve, and I'm not sure who he's talking to there right now, but uh, uh, he, he was the last to communicate with Steve, and he said that Steve Fawcett, very, very tired, uh, you know, went through some weather overnight. Uh, it's been 12 days, almost 13 days. Uh, you know, it's, it's been a, a real tough go of it for him. Uh, and, you know, there's going to be some rush uh, once, once he finally gets across the line. But uh, Bert told me that what he would do as soon as he got across uh, is that he was planning to go to bed. That was going to be his way of celebrating because he's got several more hours before he gets to touch down. Uh, you know, he breaks the record and, and completes the circumnavigation, but then uh, he's got to get to safe ground, and he's nowhere near ground right now. He's got to get farther to the north, somewhere in Australia, and at this hour, Paula, we don't know where he's going to end up, and he might not come down until later this evening. That is the latest from here. We are uh, keeping an eye on it. It's, Back to you. it's incomprehensible to even imagine the level of fatigue this guy feels, particularly out after battling all those winds over the Indian Ocean. I mean, how worn out is he at this juncture? Well, he's very worn out because he's only getting, you know, cat naps and, uh, you know, 12 days. You can imagine. We, we, none of us do great without sleep, but uh, that's one problem. And of course, he's breathing oxygen when he's up high. Uh, he's not eating particularly well. Uh, bathroom facilities are not uh, the, the, the plushest in the world. This is a really tough thing. And as Richard Branson uh, told us, Steve Fawcett may be the only guy who could have accomplished this. Five tries and, and what it takes in terms of human discomfort, he's just tenacious, which is amazing for a guy who's made millions and is a, a millionaire uh, 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 futures trader in Chicago. So uh, he's, he's really done something here, or almost done something here, Paula. Well, we are going to come back to you when he crosses that magic line, once again acknowledging that that will happen well in advance, of course, of his landing somewhere. We don't know where that's going to happen, so Jeff will come back to you uh, when you get the magic word that uh, he has indeed 
made history here. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. Bud Light Spirit of Freedom, and thank you for coming to today's press conference at Washington University in St. Louis. Welcome to the callers on the bridge. We have an exciting announcement today regarding the Bud Light Spirit of Freedom balloon. Today we'll have speaking with you Mission Control Director Joe Ritchie, Systems Director Bert Padel. And there we have the official word that Steve Fawcett has actually crossed that imaginary finish line over the ocean and he has completed his solo flight around the world in that hot air balloon uh, that uh, now being a world record and the first time ever been done. But they got to get the guy down now. That's it could be another hour and a half. He's like apparently at 27,000 feet now yeah. because of the winds shifting and him being drifting off course. They're yeah. not sure exactly where he will be. After that long journey, uh, Steve has crossed the finish line in his uh, in his trip around the world. I think Peggy may be the real hero in this. Uh, Peggy, way to hang in there. Uh, the launch team, the record shows, has done an incredible job with a small number of people compared to much more uh, professional, highly trained teams. The uh, in, a, in an aviation flight, the best flight is not the most exciting, and uh, this flight has been more boring than most, and I, uh, my hat's off to the meteorological team who, rather than helping us survive really nasty weather, did a terrific job of looking ahead and steering us around it. And uh, I, I would say this kind of mission requires really oddball different kinds of critters who need to come together and work together, which is a tough thing to do. Uh, We've struggled mightily to get them together in the past, and this year, without any struggle, it totally clicked. Thank you, Bert and your team, Luke, David. You guys have been an unbelievable pleasure to work with, and, and I say that totally sincerely and with no flattery whatever. Uh, I just want to say one personal thing, Steve. I've known you for 32 years, uh, and and clear back when we were both poor as church mice, you're the guy that, in, in that little bitty world of programming, uh, reached out a helping hand to a guy making three bucks an hour and went out of your way to give me some good advice and, and guidance. And, uh, and, you know, I think you haven't changed after you got all that money, and, and my hat's off to you for that. Uh, Luke, Bert... Who, who wants to make comments on the weather or the launch? Can we hear each other? Can we hear from Steve? Steve, they want to hear from you. You've crossed the finish line, haven't you? Yes, I have. It's, um, uh, just a few minutes ago, and uh, it's been a, long, been a long trip, and really glad to get across. Is he outside? Can you see around him? Can you see around you, Steve? Uh, yes, it's, uh, well, it's middle of it's uh, nighttime. Uh, local time is uh, 11 o'clock at night, and it's a clear night up above. Uh, I can see the stars, uh, but there's cloud cover down below. I'm uh, 250 miles south of Australia. <laughs> it seems we missed Australia on the way around, and we're taking a, um, a Luke Drillman's has found a routing for me uh, to uh, get back north into Australia for landing tomorrow. How did you mark the moment? How did you mark the moment, Steve? Uh, Steve, they want to know how you could mark the moment when you cross the finish line. Sorry, say again? How do you celebrate? Oh. How, how did you oh. celebrate? Uh, well, uh, you can't do very much celebrating here. I, uh, <laughs> I do have a, a few bottles of uh, Bud Light, but uh, <laughs> maybe saving that for the, uh, for the landing because there's no one to, to drink it with here. But that's the nature of solo flight. How does it feel after 10 years? They want to know. It's well, an enormous uh, relief and uh, satisfaction uh, because I put everything into this, all of my efforts, all of my skills. Um, I've taken the risk associated with this over this long period of time. And finally, after six flights, you know, I've succeeded. And it's a very satisfying experience. What was different this time? It's well, been a, a progression of uh, preparation. We never appreciated how difficult it was to fly a balloon around the world solo. Um, 
when I started off on this, I thought, well, maybe I might not make it the first time, but surely the second time. But then we realized that there's a lot, a lot of equipment that my team had to develop, basically invent. Uh, there's many more pitfalls than uh, we'd ever imagined, and it's taken, uh, uh, you know, six, six flights, and um, uh, and I haven't had very many uh, competitors uh, because it is uh, uh, so difficult that not very many competitors have entered this arena to make the first solo flight. Steve, one of you gentlemen, what does he have ahead of him before he gets on the ground? Uh, could you repeat that question? What have you got ahead before you get on the ground? Uh, Luke. We're going to let Luke answer this, Steve. Hello, Steve. Um, one of your weather freaks is here now. Um, I can say that you will fly nice, fair weather. 55 knots to the northeast, and we will find some nice valley in the middle of nowhere, somewhere in, in, in Australia, where, where, where you can put down your, your balloon with lesser than five knots at uh, sunset uh, tomorrow, this for you today, this evening. So, Steve, I, I want to, to say something to you. Thank you for your confidence for, you know, for us it was an, a real great adventure. We, we, didn't, we didn't know where we get, went because as a Belgium, you know, the southern hemisphere is so far away of us. After the wonder world in the north, I wished to do this with you, you know this and you asked me to do this, and I thank OC also David. David did a, a great job to avoid the thunderstorms, you know, to avoid the, the cyclones, and I think David will say something to you. Hi, Steve. Congratulations on my part, too, for you. It's, it's a great achievement. Uh, I want to thank my boss, the director of the Royal Meteorological Institute of Belgium. I also want to thank uh, NOAA, the American National Weather Service, because we have been working with our models. Without the efforts of US scientists and weather, and Luke and I are the first to recognize this, this was not been possible. So I've always maintained good relations with uh, the National Weather Services around the United States. I thank them for their efforts, for their magnificent efforts. I would like to tell that this is a Belgian US effort in meteorology. They did the science. They're great at it. We're working with it. We thank them again. We did the interpretation. And after what happened on the September of 11th, it's been a great joy and a great honor for both of us to give something back to the United States. The United States were also, were always there for Belgium when they needed us. When we can give something back, it's truly honor. We will stay here for the, to celebrate you the 4th of July. I will, we are great, we are, we are pride of that, we are proud of that. I will enjoy it very much. Thank you very much. And now Joe Castellano from Anheuser-Busch would like to congratulate you as well, Steve. Steve, Joe Castellano, on behalf of uh, August Bush, Joe, on behalf of uh, August Bush, Bud Light, and all the employees and uh, wholesalers of Anheuser-Busch, we thank you and we congratulate you. Uh, nice going. We knew you could do it way back when we got involved. And the main thing now is to get you home safely. Nice going, Steve. Well, I would like to comment on that. I think uh, the Bud Light sponsorship demonstrates uh, a real uh, uh, participation and, and willingness on the part of uh, Anheuser Bush to uh, support adventure sports uh, like this. And uh, I, I think Anheuser Bush would be proud of their sponsorship of this. And it's been a tremendous boost to my. Uh, a balloon project. Can uh, Steve comment on what adventures next? <coughs> <laughs> well, I always have uh, more things uh, in mind. I don't want to talk about too much because I'm not, uh, not even on the ground from this one yet. Uh, <laughs> but my next uh, big project is to fly a glider into the stratosphere, and we'll make the first attempts on that uh, before the end of July. Uh, Steve, it's uh, Bert. I uh, just want to uh, extend uh, uh, congratulations to you, and that's uh, also coming from uh, John, uh, Dennis, and uh, Tim. Um, you know, we've shared this with you for many years, and uh, I can, uh, all of us can really appreciate what you've done. So, can you tell us when we can expect Steve back in the States? When are you going to be back in the States, Steve? <laughs> Oh, it won't take long at all. I, I think we'll probably do a uh, press conference in uh, Sydney uh, the day of my landing, and then I'll start flying back. Uh, so I'll be back in the States in only about three days. 
you have any time reference when you expect him to actually make landfall? <clears throat> It'll be midday today in Australia, <clears throat> around the middle of the night. Well, Luke, you've got the exact times better, right? I think it was uh, in uh, GMT time um, in 18 hours, 17, 18 hours. So it is uh, 12 hours, uh, midnight our time, St. Louis time. Land, no, land for tomorrow evening. Uh, it would have been about uh, 17, <clears throat> about 18 and a half minutes ago. All right. I, I don't have, Steve, have you got the exact time you crossed? Um, yes, I started, um, oh, um, at 13, um, 40 universal time. I, I, no, actually, I did not record the exact time. That's the approximate time, 1340 universal time. The official record is coming in on the facts now. We repeat them. You've been listening to a live report from Washington University where balloonist um, Steve Fawcett no. has successfully become the first the man to fly solo uh, around the world the in a balloon, the and he is clearly is very down. excited about that. His journey is not over. They still have to get this balloon on the ground. Stay Guys. tuned to News 4 for the very latest on this. There you're hearing some of the celebration for the mission control folks here at Washington University. Again, Steve Fawcett's a trip not um, over yet. I Stay tuned to News 4 today at noon. We're going to bring you the very latest on his efforts to successfully land the solo spirit. We now return you to your regularly scheduled programming. We now return to our regular programming. ...between two positions an hour apart, uh, but the wind is, is steady up there, so, so it's going to be within... Uh, it'll be it was certainly between uh, 37 after and 41 after. Joe, when does FAI verify all this and give it their gold seal? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how that works, but I think that that it's these doc, these official reports that are the ones that they use. Uh, you, you have to have official reporting points. You're looking live that, now at the news uh, conference at Mission Control, Washington University here in St. Louis. They are celebrating at Mission Control. Steve Fawcett celebrating in his balloon as well. He has finally done it, made it around the world solo in a balloon. Says he's going to land tomorrow, probably around 7 o'clock in the morning. We're going to have more on this coming up at 11. Right now, that's all for today. We'll see you again tomorrow morning. Hitting a fire with, you know, liquid propane previous trip. all about. Yeah, so he's had some harrowing experiences. And this one almost went, I don't want to say too well, but this one went very smoothly. Well, it, it, it looks as though it did, although there was a lot of work to make this, this uh, flight a success. Uh, a lot of work with the meteorologist uh, to, to avoid the uh, storms that he was flying. He had three, three storms that uh, could have uh, spelled disaster on this flight, and the meteorologists were able to steer him around every single one of them. And, and just to, to not to, uh, to get ahead of ourselves, you're celebrating, but he's not on the ground yet. Uh, you know, that's a big deal. Yeah, he's not on the ground. To officially... Uh, make a record the pilot has to land without killing himself first and so yeah we're we're, we're gonna get back to focusing on that but we got good weather ahead and and you know there's gonna be light surface winds it won't be a perfect landing condition but it'll be good enough so uh, he, he should he should make it the rest of the way without incident guys I appreciate it I know everybody else is lining up to talk to you Joe I appreciate it Bert thank you so much appreciate the time very good to see you again and congratulations alrighty well there you go Darren that's uh, pretty neat and these guys back over here I don't know if we can get to them but this is the weather team who also was uh, given tremendous credit uh, by uh, uh, everybody who's put this together it was really a tremendous team effort and a tremendous success so I'm gonna try to get out of the way here and throw it back to you very good Exciting times, Jeff Block in uh, St. Louis, Missouri. Thank you so much for bringing that to us. We want our viewers to know that you can follow the path of Fawcett's balloon flight on his website. That address is spiritoffreedom.com.
line less than an hour and a half ago. Our Jeff Flock is at Mission Control in St. Louis, where all is not done yet until Steve Fawcett is safely on the ground. Jeff, the story is not You open. betcha. Oh, you betcha. That, that, and that's a very important part of the story. We're going to get to that in just a moment. But uh, as, you, as you point out, the headline is The Spirit of Freedom, Steve Fawcett's Balloon, here in St. Louis, which kind of calls to mind the spirit of St. Louis, doesn't it? And, uh, and another uh, pioneering uh, man in aviation. But take a look. The, uh, the banner has been uh, updated. It now says, Congratulations, Steve. And obviously, very one, everyone very, very happy here. I want to get the very latest uh, uh, from Kevin Stass, who uh, is one of the key members of the team, handles air traffic control directly that for the team. Uh, I want to get to you, Kevin, in just a moment, but first I want to listen to Steve because you were eager to hear him too. Yeah, yeah. And, and let's just take a quick uh, listen, Darren, if we can, to what Steve Fawcett had to say not long after he crossed the imaginary finish line. I put everything into this, all of my efforts, all of my skills. Um, I've taken the risk associated with this over this long period of time. And finally, after six flights, yeah, I've succeeded, and it's a very satisfying experience. Indeed, very satisfying, not only to Steve Fawcett, but to all the members of the team. And, and Kevin, i got to ask you first, uh, you got to get him on the ground, right? Well, yeah, yeah, small logistical problem <laughs> that we've got now. Um, he's heading in a northeasterly track, which we've been waiting for all night because he's been going off to the east. And he could have missed Australia, which would have not have been a good thing. No, that would not have been a good idea. Um, we, uh, we thought he might be heading for Tasmania or even New Zealand at one time during the night, but uh, we're pretty confident he's going to swing northeast over the Australian bite now. Now, uh, you work for Richard Branson, yeah. and you just talked to Richard, and yeah. I know Richard was very supportive, and, of yeah. course, they, they tried together at one point. Uh, uh, what's what's Richard have to say? Well, Richard just was um, elated. I mean, he really thinks that Steve was the only guy that could do this solo around the world, um, and he, he just thinks he's a courageous guy. As is Richard, of course. <laughs> of course, your boss. <laughs> Can you show me what you got? The, the T-shirts have been yeah. printed. Just uh, yeah, FYI, but, what's it um, say? I just uh, just printed this up a couple of minutes ago. As you can <laughs> see, it's still wet. So. Um, Bud Light Spirit of Freedom uh, has made it around the world with Steve Fawcett flying, and that's a fantastic achievement. Yeah, it is. And i got to ask you, because you did the last one. Let me go ahead and put her down. Uh, the difference, because you did the last one. You, you've done, what now, five attempts. Five, yeah. What was different this time? Why was this different? Why was this a success? Well, Steve um, made the balloon bigger, um, and also he carried more oxygen with him. Um, you know, there's probably a lot of luck involved. I mean, the, the weather has been pretty good. Meteorologists have been absolutely wonderful. Luke and um, David have done a fantastic job steering him through stuff. So, you know, it's all come together and um, it's worked and we've done it. And now, uh, as we look at, uh, at the Mission Control here over our shoulder here, we can see it uh, there. Uh, these guys now, job one is to get him on the ground. Yep. And I, I know you didn't want me to ask you this, yep. but where the heck is he going? Do you have well, any indication? Because I know you don't have complete control of it. Um, well, no, we don't. And in fact, there's a guy called Shorty Ryan, who's um, our guy in uh, Australia, who is uh, organizing helicopters, trucks, and he keeps on ringing up and says, hey, where the heck is this thing going to land? So, uh, <laughs> and you're telling Shorty? And I'm telling Shorty, well, it's going to be in Australia somewhere, probably north of the bite on the Nullarbor plane. But he says, well, that, gee, that's a big place, boy. So um, we've got a work out a strategy we've we've got direction to consider we've got the time of the day because obviously there's the weather to consider we've got dusk dawn and, and real real quick w when how, how soon um tomorrow sometime that's all i can really say tomorrow to you. our time here yeah okay yeah. so we got a ways but, to go yeah okay but don't hold okay. me to it don't hold you to it kevin i appreciate it okay. thank you sir appreciate it very much kevin stass uh, a veteran of these sorts of attempts success today success here in st louis that is the latest darren back to you yeah and jeff even before steve foss is on the ground he's already planning the next adventure it involves a glider yeah uh, incredibly and i don't know if Ke if kevin knows anything about this but his he says he's going to fly a glider the first man ever to fly a glider into the stratosphere are you going to be part of this thing at all by the way news to me jeff <laughs> if, if he's game i'm game so if he's going kevin's going okay <laughs> good luck <laughs>
there. Making commitments right here on the air at CNN. Jeff Locke, thank you so much. Well, we, we heard uh, the expert there talking about the weather. That's the key. Let's bring in a Rosie Edda to talk about the weather in Australia mm. and how it could affect faucets landing. Rosie. All right, uh, Darren, let's talk about that. This is an amazing feat indeed. And Steve Fawcett, well, he's supposed to land on the southern coast of Australia. This is a town called Forest. But we are uh, indicating that we're looking at gusty winds tomorrow when he's supposed to land. Mostly cloudy skies, and we're expecting highs around 50 to 55 degrees. But because of those gusty winds and because he is in a balloon, there is no guarantee that he can hit that mark in Forest. That's a town, though. But uh, he did circumnavigate the globe, and he was able to catch the jet stream. He started off in the southern hemisphere, and it is wintertime now, and normally the jet stream is more active in the wintertime, so that's why he was able to travel at a speeds of uh, up to or over 200 miles an hour. So good for him. He was able to do that, and he did start off in the southern hemisphere because when you travel that way, you cover over, you go over more water, and the jet stream with the winds blowing over water actually blows stronger and faster, and he didn't need a lot of permission because he wasn't traveling over land, so it made the trip a lot easier for him to do so. But it looks like, Darren, he's going to encounter some gusty winds tomorrow, mostly cloudy skies, and highs around 50, 55 degrees, so we're going to have to watch out, but it could be a bit of a shaky landing for him for tomorrow, but congratulations to him anyways, he did it. Absolutely. We will be watching for him. Rosie, thank you for that weather information. want to let our viewers know that you can also follow the path of Fawcett's balloon flight on his website. The address is spiritoffreedom.com. Well, expected to land somewhere in Australia by morning. Joining us now from Fawcett's mission headquarters, CNN's Jeff Block. Jeff, I bet it's pretty cool in that command center. It is very neat to see, and of course we were here on a few of the other tries, and so it's neat to see it all come to fruition, but it's important to say that it is not over yet. Uh, while there has been success in terms of making that circumnavigation, he still needs to get to the ground, and I want to show you what is going on as we speak right now. You see the Brain Trust over there uh, looking at, uh, pouring over maps. That's. Uh, Joe Ritchie, the fellow in the gray hair, he is the mission control director. Next to him is Kevin Stass, who uh, uh, directs to air traffic. And then next to him, uh, perhaps a little bit out of the screen there, is Bert Padelt. Uh, uh, these are the, the key members of the team trying to figure out where he's going to come down. And uh, we've got uh, one of his chief meteorologists, David DeHaynow, with us right now. Uh, you're just trying to figure out where you can get him down, and you may not get him down tomorrow morning, right? Uh, yes, normally he will, uh, he will make a landfall at zero UTC, at, at zero hour uh, midnight in St. Louis time, and then he will have to land. And that landfall means he's, he's over land. It doesn't mean he's landing, right? No, no, that means he's over land in the Sidoni area in Australia, and then we have the the option to let him land in the early morning Australian time, which is 12 hours ahead of St. Louis time, or in the evening, uh, in the early evening Australian time, because the winds are lighter then there's no turbulence. Right, because you need to make sure that you, you've got good conditions, you can't put him down when it's blowing hard and that sort of thing. Uh, of course, we have to make sure he has a safe landing. Now, I, while I've got you here, I want to ask you your impressions of Steve Foster, because we've got some, uh, some fun facts about Steve. I think a lot of people are just curious about him. He's an extraordinary guy, 58 years old, uh, investment bank made a lot of money in the trading pits in Chicago. This was his sixth attempt, although, David, your first attempt with him. Uh, and he's got world records already in ballooning, uh, sailing, and flying. And he's also done, uh, in 96, uh, driven at Le Mans. In 1992, he was 47th in the Iditarod uh, sled dog race. And then in 1985, he swum, uh, swam the English Channel. What is it like working with this man? Is he crazy? What, is, uh, what makes him do what he does? Oh, he's not crazy. He's a great adventurer. He's, he's the greatest adventurer I've ever worked with. So, and I've worked with some other people too. But he's just amazing. He's always optimistic. He uh, he has he has a, an enormous physical um, ability to do this and, and a mental ability. And I mean, it was really fun working with him here in Mission Control. Because we were talking about you know 14 hour, 14 days in this little capsule, bad food, bad everything, bad air. Uh, you wouldn't want to go through that. Oh no, definitely. That's out of the question. But I have I have much of admiration for him for wanting him to do that. Excellent, David. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you for the time. Uh, and Kira, uh, I guess we talk about his adventure, some spirit. We also need to report that the next adventure is already on the board. He said, uh, as he talked to us uh, not long after uh, uh, he uh, went across the line today, that he plans within the month to be the first man to fly a glider into the stratosphere. Now, I'm not 100% sure how high the stratosphere is, but I know it's way up there, <laughs> beyond even where he is right now. So. <laughs> We will watch that one, too, no doubt. Where does he get these ideas, Jeff? Just tell me. 
Uh, some people think maybe he's high. I don't know. He li he's kind of high on life, you know? He made a lot of money trading futures in Chicago, and he said, I'm going to, you know, do everything I always wanted to do. And God knows where it stops. Yeah. World solo in a hot air balloon. But he still hasn't landed. CNN's Jeff Block is standing in St. Louis where Fawcett's ground team is happy, but still at work. Hi, Jeff. Kira, hello to you. Mission Control here in St. Louis at Washington University. And perhaps you see behind me the, the route. I want to show you that in a moment. But first, uh, I'll let you know that we're kind of a, a bit of a lull at this hour. You know, he's uh, already passed the goal line, but, but now trying to get safely to ground. And I just want to give you a sense, you know, you may have seen the sophisticated uh, mapping, uh, computer mapping. Well, oh, here at Mission Control, they kind of do it the old-fashioned way, too. There you see the launch. That was the path across Australia to start out with. And then on uh, across the U.S., clipping the, uh, the tip of uh, South America, that was uh, three-quarters of the way. I should say that's the tip of Africa if I get my geography straight, and then on across the Indian Ocean. Now, here's where they are right now. Somewhere off uh, the coast here, still over water, we are told. So they are now in the process of trying to uh, uh, direct him in, uh, pick up the winds, because, of course, he's at the mercy of the winds. And it's been a, a tremendous team effort here. And, you know, I didn't want to end our reporting without talking to some of the team members who uh, uh, have played a particular role. Emily Fredericks is one of the student interns. Who knew that this thing was run half by student interns? Uh, you know what you're doing? <laughs> yeah, I think we do. There's 20 of us interns, and Baron Hilton gave us a lovely grant, and you know, there's, we're working around the clock, doing everything from the website to the reporting to the radio actualities. That's right. You are a journalist, uh, ab about to be a journalist here. In fact, yes. you probably are a journalist. Yes, actually. I am, and in about a month, I will be for the Associated Press. Wow, excellent. Well, you must have had quite an experience here. I've got to ask you, as we look at some of your colleagues. Uh, wh who are those guys up there in the uh, in the rafters there? Those those are interns as well. Yes, those are the what that's the web team and the radio actualities team mm -hmm. and people call in from all over the world and they get live radio updates. I got to ask you what this was like when the news finally came because you know he's done it before again and again and again. This is time number 6. What was that like when the news finally came that it really happened? It was exciting. I mean, you know, we've all had experience on this before and just you know, to finally be a part of it when it all went all the way around. It's just, it's incredible. Yeah. yeah. Well, I know Steve is very appreciative of your uh, efforts. And in fact, uh, let's listen to a little bit of what he said uh, just after he crossed the 117th meridian. Steve Fawcett. I put everything into this, all of my efforts, all of my skill. Um, I've taken the risk associated with this over this long period of time. And finally, after six flights, you know, I've succeeded, and it's a very satisfying experience. And there you see, uh, perhaps back live, there's Joe Ritchie there right now, uh, the man who has headed and led master control, mission control here. And Emily, thanks to you, and thanks to the whole team for uh, an amazing story, which we will, of course, continue to watch until it ends, either splashing down off the coast of Australia or perhaps more appropriately somewhere on the ground. That's the latest from here, Kira. Back to you. All right. Hopefully it'll be a soft landing. Thank you, Jeff Block. You said it. All right. Well, as thrill seekers go, Steve Fawcett is in his own league. Absolutely. Going on 60 now, Fawcett made millions of dollars as an investment banker. In addition to ballooning, he holds records in sailing and flying airplanes. He also raced at Le Mans. He's done the Iditarod. He even swam the English Channel. His next goal? fly a glider into the stratosphere. Oh, I can't remember if it was 100 feet or 200 yeah. feet. What was it? Yeah, it was a few hundred feet. What happened was, uh, due to a little quirk in the winds, he suddenly uh, took the wrong fork and was faced with a massive area of thunderstorms. The only way to get around it was to come down and skim just above the ocean. So he was a few hundred feet, but, but he was flying through squalls. And when these squalls would hit, they would knock the balloon down lower. So. Uh, so he was, he was skimming the waves for about a day. This was his sixth attempt, five failures previously. What, what contributed to his success this time? Well, uh, you know, we keep learning things on the other attempts. And on earlier attempts, there were flaws in the, in the overall approach that made the attempts uh, very difficult, if not almost impossible, to achieve. One after another, these flaws got cured, and this is the first flight where at the beginning of the flight I felt we had cured all the major flaws. And when you get those 
out of the way, then, then you're actually a favorite to be able to complete one of these flights. The Bud Light Spirit of Freedom had those flaws cured yeah. for the first time. Hey, Joe, quick question. We're out of time here. The circumference of the world, I, I think, is about 24,000 at its widest point. Yeah. So what right. makes 19,000 miles, roughly, around the world? Yeah, they have uh, technical rules for exactly what you have to do for it to qualify, and those rules don't require that you be exactly 24,000 miles, which would be virtually impossible the way the winds blow. Right. Uh, the way they've written the rules, we were well within in bounds. Joe Ritchie, congratulations, and our congratulations Thanks, to the entire team and obviously to Mr. Fawcett. Thank you, sir. The very first person to fly a balloon solo around the world. Team members at Mission Control celebrated. Fawcett had this to say via satellite telephone. Well, it's an enormous uh, relief and uh, satisfaction uh, because I put everything into this, all of my efforts, all of my skills. Um, I've taken the risk associated with this over this long period of time. And finally, after six flights, yeah, I've succeeded, and it's a very satisfying experience. A person celebrating. Fawcett's crew back in St. Louis had a big stake in the trip, and that includes Joe Ritchie, who's the director of Mission Control, who joins us now live. Great day for you, uh, Mr. Ritchie, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, Natalie, it's been, a, it's been a long trip, and we're glad it's over. And our congratulations, of course, to Mr. Mr. Fawcett. It took him six tries. Uh, what was it this time around that uh, really got him there to the finish line? Well, this time we used some different techniques in, in uh, dodging weather long before we got to it. And it made the difference. It meant we made it all the way without really any close weather calls. Now, he has crossed already over Australia, but has he landed on the ground yet? Uh, he hasn't crossed over Australia. He's south of Australia over the ocean, and he'll be over land in maybe seven or eight hours and hopefully can land before nightfall. What has his reaction been, obviously, as he crossed that finish line? Well, I think Steve was extremely relieved. He was really exhausted. He'd had a tough couple of days flying, and I think uh, it was just a huge sigh of relief to finally be there. And, and how significant is this accomplishment to him? Obviously, he's tried so many times. It's been his dream all along. Yeah, well, Steve's done a lot of pretty amazing things, but I think this is the highlight of all the, of all the remarkable things he's achieved in life. I think this one just stands out. And, and, and once it's behind him, it'll, it'll sort of be like, you know, his Everest. It's taken him more than six years, something like more than 60,000 miles, millions of his own dollars uh, going into this. Was there ever any time where he uh, came close to giving up? After the flight when he uh, was knocked out of the sky from 29,000 feet in the Coral Sea, uh, I think he said, enough is enough. But... I don't think it was all that long before he thought about it again and decided that, uh, that he could avoid that kind of problem in the future and, and went back and tried it again. He's been living in that balloon since June 18th. Tell us a little bit about what the cabin is like in there and what kinds of living conditions he, he was living through. Well, it's small, he can, but he can lie down and stretch out. And uh, so basically he's locked in solitary confinement with lousy food and and uh, nobody to talk to but but he's got a lot of work to keep him busy and, and he emails people so uh, so he's active up there it doesn't get it doesn't really get boring in fact if anything uh, it's it's more there's more activity than he would like to have he, he always winds up short of sleep on these deals and that's that's really the biggest single problem it's not the physical confines but it's the lack of sleep does something to your brain after a while. Well, I imagine also being solo probably uh, is a huge challenge as well, having to stay it awake. Is, yeah, it is, but Steve's a solo kind of guy. I mean, he's gone, he's taken a boat around the world solo. That takes a lot longer than this. So he's used to those long, solitary stretches. <laughs> uh, but, but the problem is, you, 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 you know, if you don't get your sleep, funny things start to happen to your brain. Well, if this has been the goal for so long, what is next for Mr. Fawcett and for your team? Because you guys have been backing him up now for uh, more than six yeah. tries. Well, now Steve wants to get in a glider and try to glide higher than anyone's ever glided. I mean, he wants to glide way over 50,000 feet, uh, which, you know, is kind of almost the edge of space. Where he wants to go, he'd have to wear a space suit, and that would be quite an <laughs> achievement and maybe more dangerous than the last one. Oh, my. Well, you got to love people like that, always working towards a goal. Thank you so much, uh, Joe Ritchie, Director of Mission Control. And again, congratulations to uh, Mr. Fawcett and to your crew. Thanks, Natalie.
He holds boating and flying records. He's been a competitor in the Iditarod sled race. He's driven at Le Mans, and he even swam the English Channel. But Steve Fawcett will be remembered for becoming the first person to fly a balloon by himself, nonstop, all the way around the world. It was his sixth attempt. Previous efforts ended in a series of forced landings, but Fawcett isn't the kind of man to give up. Born in California in 1944, he became an Eagle Scout. He began rock climbing at age 11 and went up the Matterhorn during his junior year at Stanford University. He got a master's degree at Washington University in St. Louis, in recent years the site of mission control for his balloon flights. Then he went to work in Chicago as an options trader. A friend says he was willing to assume a higher level of risk than other traders. The risks paid off handsomely. Eventually, Fawcett formed his own securities firm. He says he always thrived under pressure. In 1998, he teamed up with British billionaire Richard Branson in an attempt to fly a balloon around the world. They got more than halfway when bad weather forced them down near Hawaii. A month later, a rival team achieved the goal Fawcett and Branson had sought. But instead of giving up, Fawcett shifted his focus and decided he'd become the first person to make a balloon trip around the world flying solo. One of his attempts ended in Canada. One ended in India. When a storm shredded his balloon above Australia, he plunged into the Coral Sea. I thought it would kill me. And, um, uh, but I, uh, just in the last uh, 30 seconds, I cut away a lot of tanks. Maybe I gave it, the balloon a little bit of loft. Uh, so, uh, so I hit the water, and then the um, capsule was immediately pulled underwater and uh, filled with water. But Fawcett didn't give up, and on June 18th, his sixth attempt to make a solo balloon flight around the world began in Western Australia. Thirteen and a half days and more than 19,000 miles later, Fawcett was back where he began, crossing an invisible finish line at 117 degrees longitude and heading into the record books. Steve Fawcett's record-breaking flight is expected to continue for a few more hours until he finds a safe place to land, most likely in southern Australia. As for the future, Steve Fawcett says he's interested in flying a glider above 60,000 feet. This is, a, you know, a very proud day for all of us meteorologists because it is meteorologists, after all, at Mission Control that are being credited with playing a huge role in helping uh, Steve Fawcett finally circumnavigate the globe in a balloon. And joining me with a News 4 a Extra is David DeHaynow. He's an assistant meteorologist for Mission Control. Well, first of all, congratulations, David. Uh, thank you, Ken. It's great news to hear that he finally made it, and I know that you guys are being credited uh, in large part because he had to dodge some storms, did he not? Uh, yes, we had to avoid three uh, severe systems uh, throughout the trip, and we were able to steer him through it. All right, now we're told that I guess he has to literally backtrack a little bit to be able to land back in Australia near the launch point. Is that correct? How are you going to handle that? Yes, that's correct. Uh, now he's flying at uh, about uh, 7,000 meters or 25,000 feet, and his track is uh, good. It's uh, to the northeast, so he will catch up with land. And we think uh, it will be, he, will ma he will make a landing in the next 11 hours or something like that. So it's not over yet? No, it's not over yet, but we don't anticipate any severe weather conditions over okay. Australia. David, one of the difficult things that all of us as meteorologists, we always say, give us better data, we'll give you a better forecast. And in that part of the world, particularly over the Indian Ocean, I imagine quality data is hard to come by. Uh, yes, we have to rely on satellite data and, and computer models uh, only. So, uh, we, of course, we had the position reports for Steve every half an hour, and that's how we could verify if the forecast was uh, correct or not, if he was keeping on track. And, uh, of course, with the satellite images, we could see if there were thunderstorms developing or not. So it was a big help for us. All right, David, again, congratulations, and good, good luck trying to get him into the stratosphere on a glider. I'm sure you'll play a role in that as well. <laughs> okay, thanks, Ken. <laughs> Oh, wow. So after 10 years and numerous <laughs> failures, the eccentric millionaire called into Mission Control half a world away in St. Louis. You can't do very much celebrating here. I, uh, <laughs> I do have a, a few bottles of uh, Bud Light. In his capsule, but, uh, roughly the size of a prison a cell, time. Fawcett survived and, uh, on ready-to-eat meals, extreme temperatures, and low oxygen. Some may call it a frivolous obsession. 
His supporters call this self-made man who made his millions in stocks driven. Persistence and determination are qualities that will that trump just about every other quality you can have. Clearly, Fawcett has been able to finance his extreme challenges. In addition to his six attempts to fly around the world, he swam the English Channel, raced the Iditarod, even driven the Le Mans car race. But this feat was by far the most dangerous. There's a very dicey, uh, high-pressure, low center. In five past failed missions, Fawcett has had to crash land his balloon in Brazil, and in 1998, he barely escaped death, dropping in a freefall 29,000 feet into the Coral Sea. He was rescued at a cost of half a million dollars to Australian taxpayers. This time, Fawcett traveled along the jet streams, working with the weather, reaching the finish line just south of Perth, Australia. But the team here at Mission Control still has to figure out where to land. With a limited time frame and tricky weather patterns, they're looking for a safe place to bring the balloon down. And next month, the 58-year-old plans to set the record for flying in a glider at 50,000 feet, high into the stratosphere, proving for a man with the means the sky isn't the limit. Mika Brzezinski, CBS News, St. Louis. Here, where strong easterly winds sometimes pushed his balloon at speeds close to 200 miles an hour. The entire time Fawcett was in flight, a team of experienced balloonists and meteorologists and flight controllers was on hand around the clock at Washington University in St. Louis, there to map Fawcett's course and monitor the weather en route. The team was led by Joe Ritchie, who is with us now from Fawcett Mission Control in St. Louis. Joe, when did you know he was going to push it over the goal line? Uh, we knew a day and a half ago uh, he'd gotten around the last storm and had clear sailing, and it was kind of coasting from then in. Did you have any dark moments during this mission? Uh, sadly, you guys had become used to dealing with those in missions past. You know, <clears throat> yeah, we've had a lot of dark moments in missions, in missions past. In this one, actually, uh, we took evasive action long before we got to bad weather, and that was a, a methodological difference this time that made a big difference. So there were some kind of exciting moments, but, but nothing that I'd call a dark moment. What is different, what was different about this mission compared to the first couple that he attempted? You know, uh, this game, people used to run like, like Larry Zonka. Uh, to, to complete one of these missions, you've got to run like Walter Payton. You have to be looking downfield, bobbing and weaving, and, uh, and adjusting before, rather than just trying to run everybody over. And uh, that's what we did different this time. The, the two, three days ahead of time, we could see thunderstorms starting to form, and we took evasive action, which costs you something. You have to go sideways, you have to lose some speed, but you get yourself positioned so that by the time you get there, you're in position to get around it. And that was the difference. That's why what looked like lucky weather was actually just evading the bad weather. How do you steer a balloon? You steer it by changing altitudes. It's the only way you can steer it. At different altitudes, the wind is different speeds and different directions. And so, uh, so you can go left or right, or you can just slow down by finding a slower, uh, slower wind. And how, how did his craft this time differ from uh, previous balloons he has used? Actually, the craft was identical to last year. There was really... Uh, <clears throat> In previous flights, it was a very different craft, but we finally got the craft right, and that was right last year. What we didn't have right was, was how we bobbed and, and weaved around the weather. Well, Joe Ritchie, congratulations from uh, enthusiasts everywhere on the successful completion of the flight on behalf of Steve Fawcett and your entire flight crew there. Thank you, Brian. He's done that. Tonight, as we reported, Mission Control says he plans to land at 4 Eastern time tomorrow morning in southern Australia after a trip that started two weeks ago in far western Australia. A lot of people would love to be adventurers and quickly find out there's a reason most famous adventurers are wealthy. These hobbies are costly. Their group is exclusive. We get more on that angle of the story to kick off our coverage tonight from NBC News correspondent Pat Dawson. Steve Fawcett may be the first adventurer to successfully fly a solo balloon around the world, but believe it or not, ballooning is not his only hobby. Fawcett is also a world-class sailor and pilot. In 1985, he swam across the English Channel. He completed the Iditarod dog sled race in 1992 
and participated in the 24 Hours of Le Mans car race in 1996. Fawcett is just one member of an exclusive club of wealthy adventurers who have the time, money, and passion to take on challenges most can only dream about. These people are obviously really love attention. Um, they have big egos, uh, they're ambitious, you know, they're out to prove something and make a statement and uh, there's nothing quite like a round the world balloon trip to, uh, to put you, uh, you know, on every television set in America. Take Richard Branson, the boss of the Virgin Business Empire, who's made three attempts at ballooning around the world. And Oracle CEO Larry Ellison, who in 1998 survived the perilous Sydney to Hobart sailing race in Australia which claimed six lives. Perhaps the most costly adventure is one that goes where few people have ever gone before, outer space. Only two space tourists have ever made the journey, most recently South African internet millionaire Mark Shuttleworth. Shuttleworth followed American businessman Dennis Tito, who became the first space tourist last year. Both men paid as much as $20 million for their adventure. Risk is what America is all about. Adventure is a good thing, and uh, it's a healthy thing. And, uh, you know, I think that these guys are really sort of playing on a much larger scale than the average weekend warrior, but, uh, but why not? You know, there's always going to be the Howard Hughes of, uh, of our world, and uh, especially in this country. For Steve Fawcett, his latest ballooning journey has been a huge success, but that just means another challenge is probably just around the corner. Pat Dawson, NBC News, New York. As Pat just mentioned in the piece, British tycoon Richard Branson has also made numerous attempts to circle the globe in a balloon, uh, teaming up with Steve Fawcett, as you saw there on one of those trips. We are fortunate to have Explorer and Virgin Atlantic founder Richard Branson with us tonight by telephone from Necker Island in the Caribbean. Also, Richard Ambruso's father, Ben, took part in the first successful attempt to cross the Atlantic and later the Pacific in a balloon, trips that inspired his son to undertake many balloon adventures of his own, including the first voyage from North America to Africa 10 years ago. Richard Abruzzo is with us tonight from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Gentlemen, good evening to you both. And Mr. Branson, is there anything wrong with doing what you do? Do you think the critics are jealous? I don't think there are a lot of critics. I, I, I think that um, most, most people, particularly young people, uh, you know, like to share in people trying to uh, do things which other people think are impossible. I think what Steve has um, achieved is absolutely remarkable. I mean, he, you know, he's uh, put his life on the line. He's um, been propelled only by the wind. He's, he's um, you, know, be, you know, flown over 20,000 miles of water using oxygen masks in, you know, in terrible um, conditions, so in, very, very cold, uh, getting very, very little sleep. And um, he's proved it can be done, and through doing it, uh, the technology that will come from that will will do, I think, a lot of good to the world. Um, you know, whether whether it's uh, you know helping understand the ozone layer or our weather or sat satellites. I mean, you know, a, a lot a lot of things come from people trying to push push the barriers forward. Now that he's done it, Mr. Branson, does it still hold uh, a, any uh, uh, attraction to you, or is it does the does the ball now move? Does it become something else? Well, I think that, you know, the real challenge is to try to be the first to do something. Um, I mean, what, you know, what, one of the things which we, you know, the Virgin Group are, what, what are hoping to um, see come out of this is that now the technology has been cracked to make a balloon go the whole way around the world um, is to create a, a great sporting event where different nations can participate, that their best balloonists can be put forward. Um, and, you know, maybe every two or three years you could have you know, maybe 50 or 60 balloons heading off, and, 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 and I think it would be a great spectacle, and that's something we're, we're already working on. Mr. Abruzzo, what is it about ballooning? It is such an ancient way of getting around. Well, it's a tremendous way to travel, and, and what's so different about it than any other form of travel is you don't necessarily know your destination. That's for sure. So it's truly an adventure. Um, you, you don't really know where you're going to end up. If you have to ask, what is it about ballooning, as we just did, is it true that you're never going to get it? What, what's the question? If you have to ask, what is it about ballooning, do you, does that mean you just don't get it? Is it the kind of thing that you either feel in your gut or you don't? 
Well, exactly. My father, when I was just a kid, was the first to fly across the Atlantic and the Pacific, so it, it probably planted the seed. And uh, I just love it. Uh, those of us that, that balloon, um, it's a wonderful pursuit, and it's, you know, 200 years old. I asked Mr. Branson about the critics, and I guess the critics who do take pot shots at this either call it, uh, you know, dilettantism, or they say, look, when adventurers go out and they cost public dollars if they screw up, meaning Coast Guard has to come rescue you and all of that, that's when it really does harm the rest of us. Uh, well, I think when, do you when, have any problem? Oh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Branson, go ahead. No, I just say, I mean, when, when we have been rescued in the past by helicopters or Coast Guards, we've um, we've, we've paid our way, and I think if you, if, if you can afford to do something like this, you know, if you do run into trouble, I think it, 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 it's right that you do pay your way. Um, that, shouldn't be set a, that shouldn't set a precedent for people who can't afford it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, uh, you know, we, we, we've also, for instance, sponsored L London's ambulance helicopter because, you know, helicopters have rescued us a lot of time. We feel we need to give back. Um, so I think, you know, it's important to address critics in, you know, in, in, in that kind of way. Mr. Abruzzo, is there anything at all wrong if you've got the means? Is there anything wrong with doing what you do? Uh, I No, I think it's an inspiration for kids. It was for me. Um, you know, great rewards are often uh, achieved by taking not only financial but, but personal risk. And uh, what Mr. Fawcett has achieved is, uh, is a tremendous accomplishment. And he was persistent, if anything comes to mind to try so many times to finally achieve it. Mr. Branson, for a guy who likes action, how much is there to do on Necker Island? <laughs> um, well, I, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed um, watching, um, <laughs> watching the internet with and keeping in touch with Steve the last few days. But, um, but, but I'm uh, learning to windsurf, which um, I, I, haven't, I haven't been able to do before, and um, I'm getting pretty good at Hobie, Hobie sailing. So. Um, I'm sure we'll find some record out of that. <laughs> well, there you go. You can conquer at least your portion of the beach. Uh, gentlemen, <laughs> it's been nice having you both, and you're kind to talk to us on this subject tonight, Richard Branson and Richard Abruzzo. Thank you both. Perhaps we'll be talking to you both again from high altitudes aloft down the way. <laughs> Thanks, Bob, Luke. Come on. With as much relief as elation, perhaps the most sought-after achievement remaining in aviation falls. We're all proud of you. Okay. Uh, biggest day of my life. Thank you. Says Steve Fawcett <laughs> on speakerphone, still aloft. Well, it's enormous uh, relief and uh, satisfaction uh, because I put everything into this, all of my efforts, all of my skills. Um, I've taken the risk associated with this over this long period of time, and finally, after six flights, you know, I've succeeded, and it's a very satisfying experience. But it's not over yet. At Mission Control at Washington University in St. Louis, where he's an alum, up goes a congratulatory banner, then out come the protractors. The team poring over maps of the Australian coast, trying to vector spirit of freedom in to a soft place to land getting him safely on the ground impossible until dusk there when winds calm. Keys to success on this, his sixth try. Newcomer, Belgian meteorologist Luke Trulemans, who joined the team after guiding the first successful around the world balloon flight by two men in 1999. Thank you for your confidence. For and the hard-earned experience of people like Mission Control Director Joe Ritchie, who had seen it all in the five failures, storms that battered the capsule, not enough fuel and oxygen, a harrowing ditching in the Coral Sea. That was enough drama for Ritchie, Fawcett's longtime friend and partner in the Chicago Futures Pits, where Fawcett made the fortune that bankrolled his dream. In an aviation flight, the best flight is not the most exciting, and... Uh, this flight has been more boring than most. And Anderson, we should point out that uh, up until now, Steve Fawcett has been bankrolling his own, uh, his own uh, adventures. This time, however, he had a sponsor, and though we don't like to draw a lot of attention to that, as you reported at the outset, he will be celebrating with Bud Lights. So you can perhaps figure it out for yourself. <laughs> Back to you. So, Jeff, what, what is this new venture now he plans to do? And, and uh, I mean, doesn't this guy want to rest for a while? Well, it's funny. We talked to the folks behind us here. Uh, perhaps you can see them back there. Uh, the, the folks from Mission Control, a lot of them said, what's he talking about? And apparently, some of them know he is talking about taking a glider up into the stratosphere, which we have determined to be some 60,000 uh, feet into the air and become the first person to pilot it in the stratosphere. And he intends to do that, he says, this month. <laughs> He 
holds boating and flying records. He's been a competitor in the Iditarod sled race. He's driven at Le Mans, and he even swam the English Channel. But Steve Fawcett will be remembered for becoming the first person to fly a balloon by himself, nonstop, all the way around the world. It was his sixth attempt. Previous efforts ended in a series of forced landings, but Fawcett isn't the kind of man to give up. Born in California in 1944, he became an Eagle Scout. He began rock climbing at age 11 and went up the Matterhorn during his junior year at Stanford University. He got a master's degree at Washington University in St. Louis, in recent years the site of mission control for his balloon flights. Then he went to work in Chicago as an options trader. A friend says he was willing to assume a higher level of risk than other traders. The risk paid off handsomely. Eventually, Fawcett formed his own securities firm. He says he always thrived under pressure. In 1998, he teamed up with British billionaire Richard Branson in an attempt to fly a balloon around the world. They got more than halfway when bad weather forced them down near Hawaii. A month later, a rival team achieved the goal Fawcett and Branson had sought. But instead of giving up, Fawcett shifted his focus and decided he'd become the first person to make a balloon trip around the world flying solo. One of his attempts ended in Canada. One ended in India. When a storm shredded his balloon above Australia, he plunged into the Coral Sea. I thought it would kill me. And, um, uh, but I, uh, just in the last uh, 30 seconds, I cut away a lot of tanks. Maybe I gave the balloon a little bit of loft. Uh, so, uh, so I hit the water, and then the um, capsule was immediately pulled underwater and uh, filled with water. But Fawcett didn't give up, and on June 18th, his sixth attempt to make a solo balloon flight around the world began in Western Australia. Thirteen and a half days and more than 19,000 miles later, Fawcett was back where he began, crossing an invisible finish line at 117 degrees longitude and heading into the record books. Wolf Blitzer, CNN. Fawcett's flight joins a long list of aviation milestones. The impact it will have on travel, however, is still up in the air. Head to our website, cnnstudentnews.com, for a look at Fawcett's amazing mode of transportation. Steve Fawcett set a record Monday. Never mind, he was the only one trying to obtain it. He flew nearly 20,000 miles, as high as 35,000 feet, at speeds of up to 200 miles per hour. Oh, wow. So after 10 years and numerous failures, the eccentric millionaire called into mission control half a world away in St. Louis. You can't do very much celebrating here. I, uh... <laughs> I do have a, a few bottles of uh, Bud Light. In his capsule, but, uh, roughly the size of a prison cell, time. Fawcett survived and, uh, on ready-to-eat uh, meals, extreme temperatures, and low oxygen. Morning, Some may call it a frivolous obsession. His supporters call this self-made man who made his millions in stocks driven. Persistence and determination are qualities that will that trump just about every other quality you can have. Clearly, Fawcett has been able to finance his extreme challenges. In addition to his six attempts to fly around the world, he swam the English Channel, raced the Iditarod, even driven the Le Mans car race. But this feat was by far the most dangerous. There's a very dicey, uh, high-pressure, low center. In five past failed missions, Fawcett has had to crash land his balloon in Brazil, and in 1998, he barely escaped death, dropping in a freefall 29,000 feet into the Coral Sea. He was rescued at a cost of half a million dollars to Australian taxpayers. This time, Fawcett traveled along the jet streams, working with the weather, reaching the finish line just south of Perth, Australia. But the team here at Mission Control still has to figure out where to land. With a limited time frame and tricky weather patterns, they're looking for a safe place to bring the balloon down. And next month, the 58-year-old plans to set the record for flying in a glider at 50,000 feet, high into the stratosphere, proving for a man with the means the sky isn't the limit. 
Mika Brzezinski, CBS News, St. Louis. Thursday morning, that would be about 6 o'clock Eastern time tonight. The 58-year-old Chicago millionaire yesterday became the first person to circumnavigate the globe in a balloon alone 13 and a half days after he set out. Soon, Fox will be headed for his next adventure. He's hoping to set the altitude record for a glider flying into the stratosphere. Page, it seems this guy just has too much time on wow. his hands. Wow. For Fawcett's Mission Control team, Mr. Tobias, thank you very much for joining us. Sure thing. So what's the latest regarding the wind conditions and, uh, and the possible landing? Um, the winds look fine for where we're looking at landing. Um, we wanted eventually to, uh, sorry, before we wanted to land him, before it became sunset his time, um, but the winds on the ground there were quite gusty, so we had him fly through the night, which he's currently doing now, and when sun rises his time, we'll go ahead and get him down as soon as we can. Talk about the risky nature of landing a balloon, and that's why you're so concerned about the winds. Well, the Bud Light Spirit of Freedom balloon is about 200 feet tall um, and about 100 feet wide, and so this thing's huge. And if you have winds that I believe we were looking at before, about 20 to 35 knots, um, that's about 45, 40, 45 miles an hour, I mean, that would blow the thing around everywhere, and it would be extremely hard for him to come down on a smooth landing um, so he doesn't injure himself or the capsule or anything like that. So, Mr. Tobias, has there been any celebrating since yesterday morning when uh, Mr. Fawcett officially crossed? the so-called finish line? Uh, we had a round of cheers, but uh, after about 30 minutes, we got back to uh, focusing on his flights and making sure we get him down. Um, once he lands, I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll be partying. And that landing should come up sometime today. Mr. Tobias, thank you so much for joining sure, us. We appreciate thank your you. time. Well, speaking of hot air, balloonist Steve Fawcett <laughs> is still aloft after completing his two-week solo flight around the world. The successful trip came after five previous attempts by Fawcett. Joining us now from Mission Control at Washington University is Barry Tobias, a member of Fawcett's Mission Control team. Morning, Barry. Good morning. Now, what time did Fawcett actually complete the trip, and why didn't he land at that point? Um, Steve completed the trip at uh, 1.53 uh, Greenwich Mean Time, which, quick calculation, was about 8.53 our time uh, yesterday. Uh, he was over water at the time when he crossed it a couple hundred miles south of Australia, and so it's taken a while for him to veer back north so he's over land. Um, the last thing we want to do is ditch him in the ocean, so we want to keep the capsule <laughs> and keep him. I'm sure he's happy to hear that. So exactly yeah, well. what is the next step? When, when, uh, when will he be on the land? Uh, we're looking at having him land around um, sunrise his time. So that's uh, about 3, 4 p.m. our time here. And uh, we want to get him down as soon as possible when the sun rises so he can see where he's landing and not run into any kangaroos or dingoes around there. So. <laughs> Barry, what were the factors that made this trip a success? Um, a few things. Uh, we, we've learned some lessons over the past couple of times um, with respect to what we should bring on board for duration flight. Um, and then also a part of it is a bit of luck. Um, I mean, forecasting the weather 14 days in advance, it, it's, you know, you have some idea of what's going on, but it's not all that accurate. And the last couple of flights, it's the about 9 to four, 13 days of, um, into the flight is when we've had problems. And so this time we've, um, we're lucky in terms of there wasn't any terrible weather then. And the weather that was uh, causing issues, we saw well in advance and were able to come up with ways around it. Barry Tobias, thank you very much for joining sure us this morning. Yeah. Up front this morning, American billionaire Steve Fawcett is facing perhaps his greatest challenge yet. He made history yesterday by becoming the first solo balloonist to go around the globe. But now those strong winds that propelled him to record speeds are no longer helping. In fact, they're hurting him. Landing the huge 140-foot-tall foot balloon has been delayed and will likely be the riskiest part of the entire trip. Jeff Flock now. standing by at Fawcett's Mission Control in St. Louis to fill us in on what Mr. Fawcett is up against. Good morning, Jeff. Indeed, Paula, you're right on the money, and uh, Steve Fawcett, instead of an American morning this morning, has got an Australian morning. The good news, though, is that he's over land. Uh, that took place uh, late last night, uh, under the early morning hours, and so that's good news, and they've got a lot of Australia to play with, they say. Uh, but, uh, of course, the problem is getting him on the ground, and I want to get the very latest on that. Let's, though, take a look inside the mission control. As you can see, it's still uh, humming there, because the mission is not over yet. And, in fact, uh, the record does not even become official till you get that capsule on the ground because uh, I understand if there's a catastrophic problem or something Kevin Stoss uh, uh, and he has to bail out then 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 it's all over so your job one is to get him on the ground where's that stand um, we're trying to get him on the ground at the moment uh, he's flying along about 6,000 feet uh, well, I can see him if I'm in Australia. Look oh, yeah. Him. Yeah, you could see him. Uh, no problem at all, except he's dark, of course. Yeah. Uh, um, but, uh, yeah, we're trying to get him on the ground, um, hopefully around about dawn tomorrow um, in Australia.
Now, how dangerous is this to put him down? Why didn't you do it over? We expected he'd be on the ground now. Uh, why didn't you do it? Well, as he crossed the coast, uh, he crossed the coast at Seduna, and uh, the weather forecast was pretty, pretty bad. So um, we decided to send him on an extra night, which um, we... How, how's he with that? Um, well, I think we were pulling straws as to who was going <laughs> to ring him up and tell him he got to spend an extra night in the capsule. But he took it pretty well, actually. So uh, um, he's, he's now going into, well, he's in night time at the moment. So we're hoping to put him down at dawn. There's always <laughs> more than a little bit of drama where Steve Fawcett is concerned. Uh, do you see any drama here? What's the impact? You put him down and the winds are strong. What potentially goes wrong? Well, he can get dra dragged across the, uh, the Australian bush. So we don't really want to do that and it can have a hard impact on the ground shake everything around you know you could get injured I mean all sorts of problems so that's why we decided to put him down at dawn how's everybody holding up here obviously you're getting more time <laughs> here at mission control than you had intended uh, uh, how's everybody doing uh, doing all right I mean uh, Barry and I haven't had much sleep over the past uh, 24 36 hours but we're all in pretty good shape but you're buoyed up by the fact that you know he's actually done it and um, the last bit of the mission is just around the corner. Okay, Kevin. I appreciate the Thanks, time. Jeff. Thank you, sir. We're going to let you get back to it. Paula, that's the latest from here. Of course, we'll continue to watch it. It's going to be a while, though. Another uh, many hours to go. Steve Fawcett in the air before he gets on the ground. I, you know, that's a good question. Last time I know he slept was just after he crossed the finish line and we were done with all the press conferences. He uh, was exhausted after quite a quite a few days of flying. Um, that's the last time I know he slept. I'm sure he's got a couple hours in between since then and now. Um, with regard to eating, I have no clue. But I mean, uh, obviously a person has to sleep, so did he just wait until it was smooth sailing and then you all have some way of waking him up? Um, well, he usually gets, uh, he usually sleeps for about an hour, sets his alarm, wakes up an hour, checks emails, sees his, if there's anything from us. Um, if there is any emergency and we have to get hold of him, we can call him up on a satellite phone that will wake him up. But for the most part, um, he communicates with us. We try and avoid waking him up in case he's taking some naps. Yeah, we're obsessed with sleep <laughs> on this shift at this hour. How did the uh, balloon hold up? Uh, the, uh, the Bud Light Spirit Freedom Balloon is doing great. Um, it's just flying quite smoothly now at about 6,000 feet off the ground. And he has been buzzing since yesterday morning, and Barry Tobias joins us live to talk more about the flight. Barry, it's good to see you again. Just sure thing. So give us an update, if you would, as far as when will uh, Mr. Fawcett land? Uh, right now we're looking at landing in between 4 and 5 p.m. our time, St. Louis, in about four and a half hours. Uh, we want to have him land as soon as he sees some sun so he can guide himself down, avoid any kangaroos or dingoes running around, and, uh, but get him down as quick as possible. Now, um, he ended up crossing the so-called finish line over water instead of land. Why was that? Well, the uh, wind track that he was on took him uh, south of Australia, and so the finish line is just a line that goes north-south, no matter uh, where he's located on that. Um, as long as he crosses over east of it, he's past the finish line, and so he just happened to be over um, the Indian Ocean when he did that. So now we're veering him up north, he's over land, and now we're just waiting for that sunrise. You know, Barry, we've talked a lot about the, uh, the actual accomplishment itself, but we haven't talked a lot about the cost. What did this cost? I could honestly not tell you. They keep me away from bookkeeping for a good reason. <laughs> <laughs> and why would that be? <laughs> You're not well, going to We won't go into that. <laughs> um, and, and it's also interesting that I understand his next adventure, he wants to fly a glider into the stratosphere. Are I, you going to be a part of that one? Um, I haven't been asked yet. If he asks, I'll be more than happy to, but uh, uh, not yet. <laughs> all right. Well, Barry, it's been, uh, it's been a pleasure talking with you sure this thing. morning. Thanks for all the updates. Okay. Before we get to that, though, American adventure Steve Fawcett. He is scheduled to touch down in Australia a little later today after becoming the first person ever to fly a balloon solo around the world. Joe Ritchie is the director of Fawcett's mission control team. Joe, good morning again. Morning, Matt. I, I figured by this time Steve Fawcett would be sitting in a bathtub with a beer in his hand or at the very least taking a long nap. What happened? Yeah, we, we hope so, too. The problem was the winds didn't do exactly what was projected, so the... Uh, the Bud Light Spirit of Freedom got blown south, way out over the, uh, the bite, and just recently made landfall. Uh, he's got to wait until dawn so that he's got light to land and then land before the sun heats up the ground. So uh, it should be about 10 hours from now. So how much control do you have of where he lands in Australia? I, mean, I don't have to tell you, that's a big continent, and large portions yeah. of it are pretty barren. Yeah, you don't need a lot of control out there. It doesn't make much difference. You go any way you want, and you're going to land in a big flat spot. 
Uh, but you've got a little bit of control. The wind shifts as you come down, so you can take a different level and get different speeds and different angles, and it's no problem to find a suitable landing spot in the middle of Australia. The problem is just getting people in there to pick up all the equipment. Joe, let me ask you this. We've all, we've all seen video of hot air balloons landing, but the recreational types of hot air balloons, how long does it take for that huge balloon to stop? Well, it's, it, that's all a function of the wind. If you've got a uh, 12-knot surface wind, it's going to drag it along the ground for a long time. And if you've got no wind, it'll just stand up. It'll just plop down and stop right there. And, and Steve basically just puts on the seatbelt and hangs on for the landing? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think he puts a seatbelt on. I think he wants to stay kind of free so that if, if a propane tank starts to catch fire or something, he can scamper out of there. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it, it's a relatively gentle landing. You're, you're moving at very slow speeds. He's been traveling for an awful lot of days now, and how frustrating is it for him to have to wait this extra amount of time to land? I know Mission Control just spoke to him. What's his mood like? Uh, I think his mood's real upbeat, but you know, when you, when you think you're going to land at one time after a trip like that, and you get the end in sight, and then you get delayed by another 14 hours because you, you miss your night landing and have to wait till daylight, I, I think that night looks like an awfully long night to Steve right now. Joe, how much, just remind me here, how much did all this cost? Don't know, and... Uh, oh, come on, you, you have a ballpark, you. I'm sure. <laughs> no, uh, good old Bud Light helped us out with this one, and so, so it cost, from Steve's standpoint, it cost a lot less than, than past uh, trips, and they've been an unbelievable sponsor. But when you think about the, the six attempts to accomplish this goal, are we talking about tens of millions of dollars? Are we talking oh, no, about... no. No, you know, I did some figuring once, and I figured this cost about a fifth as much as the big boys uh, spent. Less than that, actually, the, uh, the ones with the huge balloons with the pressurized capsules. So this is relatively a poor boy operation. Well, he's, he's done it, and I know you're all proud of that. Joe Ritchie at Mission Control, we appreciate your time, and, and our best to Mr. Fawcett. Thanks, Matt. Uh, ending a record-breaking balloon flight. This just in, he has now, according to the Associated Press, landed safely in Australia, the first individual to go around the world solo in a hot air balloon. Congratulations once again to Steve Fawcett. ...miles circumnavigating the globe, and one of the most dangerous parts of this whole procedure is landing. Uh, it's about an hour and a half after dawn in Australia, about 8 o'clock in the morning there, and he was able to see the ground about an hour and 20 minutes ago and pick out a landing spot. Of course, this all depends on what the weather is like on the ground. If it's windy, it's going to be much more dangerous to land that aircraft. In addition, if it's cloudy, it may be also difficult to land. But if you're hearing on the wires that he's landed in Australia, they haven't heard that here at Mission Control. We haven't yet found that out for sure, but hopefully he's landed and he's safe. Reporting live from Washington University, Mike Owens, News Channel 5. Let you know, but Associated Press, again, is reported that he is down in the outback. Now, we'll show you some pictures that we shot earlier today here at Mission Control as the excitement began to build once daylight dawned in Australia because that is when Fawcett would be able to make the decision to begin the descent. Of course, when he missed uh, his chance last night, he had to stay aloft overnight. He couldn't land in the darkness and they wanted to keep him at a safe altitude but with slow winds. And as you mentioned, there was one frightening moment when there was a fire at a hose connection. Luckily, he was awake at the time. He saw the fire. He was able to put it out. And one thing that helped Mission Control take that news is they were notified of the fire in the same email that they were notified of it being put out safely and Fawcett being okay. The next big hurdle, of course, is the landing, and that's not necessarily a cakewalk. So let's hear what Fawcett will have to do as that approaches. He has to stop the burners, that's the first thing, that's very logic. He also has to start uh, evolving helium, because the helium is what's keeping him uh, in, in the sky. And he has to do that very carefully and gradually, but he, he, I mean, he's an experienced pilot, so we don't think there will be much problems. And according to the report from the Associated Press, a photographer says that he saw Fawcett touch down safely. Again, as you can see from our live pictures, Mission Control is huddling. They are waiting to get that word, as is the press here, the rest of us waiting to hear. We are expecting a celebration when it comes, and certainly a press conference. And yet again today, we should have a live voice hookup with Steve Fawcett. So hopefully, we will be able to bring that to you in this newscast. If not, we'll be here when it happens. Vicki? That would certainly be good news if he's already on the ground, Lori. We will check back with you for an update. Thank you. Lori Waters from Michigan.
Mission Control. The World Solar Flight yesterday, it has been a tense 24 hours as he waited to land, though, a fire in his balloon forcing him to climb out this morning. Mission Control saying that fire started in a hose connected to the balloon's burner. Another live look here at Mission Control again as we await official word here at Washington University. A news conference expected here as soon as that official word comes in. We'll bring you that within the next hour. For now, we're back to you. All right, Lynn, thank you. We'll get back to you, too. I'm an understated guy, but I thought a fire was kind of a serious deal. Any fire on, uh, in this kind of a situation is extraordinarily dangerous because it can spread very rapidly, uh, start burning through hoses, and uh, you'd be flying a, uh, you know, just, uh, just a bomb. But fortunately, I was awake, and, I, and just as this hose uh, broke, I was able to jump and uh, turn off the uh, tank, and uh, it, the fire did not spread. But, um, you know, I did that all in a matter of two seconds, and uh, I'm glad uh, I didn't spend any more time than that. Well, when you told me the other day, uh, a few hours, about 12 hours ago, that you were still kind of concerned about the last bit of this flight, I guess I could have thought you were being superstitious, but maybe you had a little premonition there. Where, how did the hose break? It was the, uh, it was the fitting of the hose uh, that I had uh, fastened when I was at altitude, uh, 30,000 feet, and it's very cold, and uh, coming down to low altitude, uh, you know, the, the steel of the fitting uh, expanded and um, you know, basically just opened itself up. Hmm. Mm, indeed, that's mm -hmm. the voice of Steve Fawcett who has landed in Australia. He broke the record yesterday but mm -hmm. was only able to land today. They were discussing a fire that he had aboard yes, the balloon last scary, night. but he did set the record. First person to fly solo around the world in a hot air balloon and we'll have more on that coming up in our future newscast. Yeah. Was, uh, very dangerous situation on the landing. Hmm. We've got, uh, you got a lot of press people here with some questions. Go ahead. My question is, considering how dangerous your last moments have been, are you still going to take the glider flight and why? Considering how dangerous the last moments were, are you still going to take the glider flight and why? Oh, well, the glider project is a completely different uh, project. And, um, a different risk. Uh, yes, I suppose it's risky, but uh, I'm enormously relieved to have the balloon project done. That finally I've done the first solo, and I don't have to expose myself to that danger. Uh, I think the, uh, the the balloon flights have been the most dangerous thing that I've ever been involved in. My name is Mike Cohen, Steve. I'm a reporter at Channel 5 KSDK here in St. Louis. Question: What was the most dangerous part about the landing? Was it the wind? Uh, the, the balloon not detaching? That Could you hear that, Steve? Uh, no. Uh, what was the most dangerous part of the landing? Was it the wind? Was it the rip panel not coming out? Uh, uh, just lay that out. Well, the wind speed was, was is by itself a satisfactory. You can bra I braced myself in the capsule when I would hit, and um, each time I'd bounce up and come back and hit, and hitting at uh, that speed is, is really not a problem when you're braced for it. Uh, but the problem of not being able to deploy the deflation system uh, meant that I could just drag forever. And We've been listening to Steve Fawcett talking yeah. to Mission Control via satellite phone. He is on the ground, has landed safely, successfully in Australia. Isn't he the calmest guy you ever heard for what he's just gone through? Exactly. University, Laurie. Well, Larry, you can see the sign. They were holding it up just a moment ago. Mission impossible accomplished. It is all smiles and a few Anheuser-Busch products here, one of the sponsors of the flight. Now that mission has been accomplished, you can take a look behind me. There is no more tension here. Earlier today, we can show you a little bit of the celebrating, and then a few minutes later, we'll show you what it was like for hours here this afternoon, because as soon as it was daylight in Australia, Steve Fawcett was making the decision when to land and mission control was helping him as much as possible but at that point it was the pilot's decision Fawcett, of course, had an, an amazing journey. He had already accomplished his feat, but one thing remained, and that was getting on the ground. And as we heard from him this afternoon, it wasn't as smooth as he might have hoped. In fact, this was uh, one of the worst, uh, uh, most difficult landings I've ever had. It was forecast to be only um, 
six knots of wind, and it was 20 knots of wind. Oh. And, and I had the same problem again. The deflation system didn't work. So I was really dragging and bouncing. And the landing place is almost too good to be true. It's 60 miles east of Lake Yama Yama. You couldn't have written that one up. Barry Tobias headed up the Washington University Volunteer Project here. You have to be so happy. Tell me about these hours, though, before that safe landing. Oh, uh, we're, we're pumped right now and excited. Um, the hours before, we were uh, just kind of waiting. It was nightfall for Steve, and he was just coasting along at about 5,300 feet, waiting for that sunrise to come so he could finally put it down. Uh, we were here just watching every position report come in, and just watching that time go and we were getting anxious catching a couple of cat naps and just you know waiting for that moment and now it's all over and that's right now we got to figure out what to do with the rest of the week and reporters are eavesdropping we're hearing there's a party tonight well there may be we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll keep that we'll, we'll let you know later <laughs> okay not ready for prime time just yet for the party back to you larry this channel 5's mike owens was in washington university's mission control center as the two-week journey ended mike Deanne, it took the sixth try, but Steve Fawcett made that entire trip. He circumnavigated the globe by himself in that balloon. It took uh, 14 days. He touched down about 60 miles from what's called Lake Yama Yama in the Australian outback. And here at the Mission Control, his handlers were ecstatic. <laughs> Fawcett took off June 19th, 19th and finished his record float yesterday, but it took another full day to land safely. And thanks to the international dateline, Fawcett landed on the 4th of July, a holiday, I should mention, not observed down under. Fawcett had some fireworks of his own early this morning when a propane hose got a leak, set fire to itself, and he had to put it out by crawling out of his balloon capsule. He landed it's about 7.30 a.m. Australia time, and... Uh, in a dry creek bed, and at, at the last moment, a device to deflate his balloon didn't work right. Well, the wind speed was, was, is by itself a satisfactory. You can bra I brace myself in the castle when I would hit, and um, I mean, each time I'd bounce up and come back and hit, and hitting at uh, that speed is, is really not a problem when you're braced for it. Uh, but the problem of not being able to deploy the deflation system uh, meant that I could just drag forever. And uh, uh, some of my team members came, uh, came to assistance and uh, helped me finally uh, you know, pull out the rip panels. Fawcett, ever the adventurer you'd think would be resting on his laurels at this point, enjoying the warmth of his victory, circumnavigating the globe by himself. But no, he's now talking about taking a glider flight into the stratosphere, and that will be happening in New Zealand, perhaps at the end of July. Reporting live from Washington University, Mike Owens, News Channel 5. Out aboard the craft. Fawcett is the first man to circle the globe solo by balloon. Children. The first solo balloon trip ever around the world. Mission control for the journey was Washington University, his business school alma mater. Fox 2's Len Turner is live there tonight with the latest. Len? And Dick, mission control nearly empty tonight. Take a look, just a few folks still around here. Most of the folks who helped Steve Fawcett make his way into the record books are out tonight celebrating. <laughs> At Mission Control Wednesday, jubilation. A flight once thought impossible, now a mission accomplished. This is one of the first pictures back from the Australian outback. Steve Fawcett and his massive balloon touching down there after a bumpy final night in the air. This was a tough night. Uh, I had uh, severe turbulence at, uh, early in the evening. And uh, in fact, I had my parachute on in case I had to jump. In the final hours of the flight, Fawcett faced a balloonist's worst nightmare, fire. Flames shot from a hose connected to the balloon's burner. Fawcett forced to climb out of his airtight capsule to extinguish the blaze. Just as this hose uh, broke, I was able to jump and uh, turn off the uh, tank, and uh, it, the fire did not spread. But, um, you know, I did that all in a matter of two seconds, and uh, I'm glad uh, I didn't spend any more time than that. With mission control in full swing, Fawcett landed one day after setting a new world record or a solo balloon trip around the globe. Success came after five unsuccessful tries, trips plagued by bad weather and technical trouble. It turned out to be exciting on the last day, but these are, these are fluky things. Uh, a hose breaking and starting a propane fire, those are things, there's not much, you know, you just, uh, what happens, happens.
Now, tonight, Steve Fawcett says he hopes to return here to St. Louis soon for a big party celebrating his world record. Meantime, the capsule part of his balloon is headed off to the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum in Washington. We are told tonight that it will be placed in a very fitting spot next to Charles Lindbergh's Spirit of St. Louis. Mm. Dick? I'm not sure the event sh should have equal billing, but uh, that's the way it'll be. Thank really um, um, made our decision uh, that we based our decision on. So nothing to do with the fact that in Australia that dawn was actually the 4th of July? Um, no, I know that a lot of people will probably think that, but it was actually a decision that was based on the weather, but it was great. I mean, you know, um, Steve landing on the 4th of July was very fitting. Now, we followed uh, his previous attempts, of course. What was it that made the difference this time around on the sixth attempt? Well, I think, you know, there's varying factors. Um, Steve built a bigger balloon. Um, he had um, more oxygen because he had oxygen problems last time. And, you know, he's learned from um, different things. Um, you know, we had um, a, a lot of luck. Um, we had some good meteorologists. Um, and... Um, it was just a, a, a good team effort. Kevin Stass at Mission Control in Missouri. Thank you. Okay. So it's Mission Control at Washington University cheering the news of that landing. Hours before Fawcett touched down, the balloonist had to leave his capsule in freezing night temperatures to put out a fire. The 58-year-old admits he was nervous until the minute he finally made landfall. Any fire on, uh, in this kind of a situation is extraordinarily dangerous because it spreads very rapidly. Uh, start burning through hoses, and uh, you'd be flying a, uh, you know, just, uh, just a bomb. Unfortunately, I was awake. Well, it is a success, of course. Just the same faucet says today's landing was the worst of his six flights. During the day, his Spirit of Freedom balloon landed in the Australian outback early today, Australian time. That was yesterday evening, our time. The balloon bumped along the ground for 15 minutes before coming to a stop. Later, Fawcett discussed his record-setting round-the-world flight. It's just a marvelous experience. It's uh, relaxing on the one hand because there's enough time to get your work done. But, uh, but it's tense on the other hand because you have to be re ready to respond to emergencies. And I had uh, emergencies practically every day with the equipment uh, that required immediate repair. Fawcett later toasted his ground crew in Australia with, of course, a Bud Light. Anheuser-Busch sponsored his flight. Earlier, mission controllers at Washington University celebrated the end of the first solo balloon flight around the world. Fawcett says he wants to return to St. Louis soon to host a big party celebrating the flight. ...of scientists help guide Steve Fawcett, a Washington University graduate, into the history books. And we're very happy to have with us tonight two very important members of that team. We have the air traffic control coordinator, which is Kevin Stoss, and the assistant meteorologist for that flight, which is David Dehanow. Thank you for joining you, both of us. And we also have our News 4 meteorologist, Joe Petrovich, here to e enjoy their experiences vicariously in terms oh, yes. of making history and also to ask some very pointed questions about information I'm sure you're interested in. First of all, let's talk about... Congratulations, because we'd like to congratulate you guys for making history and right here in St. Louis. So thanks for doing that. Oh, thanks, Robbie. And thank you. All right. How does it feel to finally be successful? This was his sixth attempt. Uh, well, I mean, it's a big, big relief. I've been involved with uh, around-the-world balloon flights for about six, seven years, and uh, finally successful. So. And you? Uh, this was the first time I worked for Steve, also for my colleague Luke, so uh, he came to visit us in Brussels and asked for us to join his team, right. and uh, we did it, and, and we were, I mean, it was an honor to be part of his team, and we were successful this time. Many observers actually credit the meteorologist with making this a successful mission. Is that uh, compliment well placed, accurately placed? Yes, yeah, definitely. I mean, David and Luke did a fantastic job. Um, they, they were on the ground looking at the, um, the weather. Mm -hmm. um, they were looking at all the different winds at different altitudes and really steering Steve. Um, they would tell him to go up or go down. I mean, he was up at 34,000 feet at one time. And they told him to go down to about nine, 500 feet. So, um, no, I think they did a fantastic job. Yeah, now, looking at this, a totally different type of forecasting than what I do here at News 4. I do it for a small area in the country. 
you're doing it not only for the world, but also for a moving target. I mean, the, move, the, the forecast area moves, moves throughout constantly. the day. Yeah. Sometimes he was moving at speeds of up to 200 miles an hour, as yeah. we understand yeah, that's it. Correct. So, so that's what correct. type of things do you look at to, to forecast on a moving target? Well, of course, you have to have a good global uh, forecast model. And we, used, we prefer to use the United States global uh, aviation model, which is uh, very good. And uh, we also try to anticipate the problems at least two or three days uh, ahead. So when we thought there was a chance of thunderstorms or severe weather, we immediately run our tra uh, trajectory model and try to look for solutions to avoid the bad weather and, and the thunderstorms. And because of we, we always try to have at least two or three uh, options in case option A was failing, we, can, we could go to plan B and C and so on. So the main goal was never to take any risk with Steve's life and, and, and not jeopardize his life or the flight. And then uh, if we were sure that he was in safe conditions, then we started looking for the fastest winds and um, to guide him around the world. But it's, it's kind of sometimes, you, I mean, it was in the southern hemisphere. That's also a hemisphere which is not that easy to forecast for. But uh, sometimes you have, I mean, you start forecasting for Australia and then you, have, you go to the Pacific, to the Andes, at the, to, to all the other, to the Atlantic, Africa and the Indian Ocean. So you have to keep a little on track on what's happening, not only at one place, but also on the other part of the world. So how long did you st actually study the southern hemisphere before going and taking on this task? Well, um, Luke and I were busy with that. Um, we started two years ago, because not because we knew Steve would ask us, but we knew somehow, we, we knew th there were rumors that balloonists wanted to fly in the southern hemisphere. And because we already did balloon forecast in the northern hemisphere, um, also sometimes in the southern hemisphere, but never around the world attempt. So it was very important to know the, the characteristics of the southern hemisphere. But additionally, the forecast models also improved on the southern hemisphere. So that, I mean, that, that was a big point for us also. So I would like to, to congratulate the scientists also because without their help, uh, it would not be a success. Kevin, you seem to have, and I visited Mission Control, you seem to have a very fluid situation, as you said, yeah. all the time changing. For example, I witnessed when you thought the day before he touched down that he was going to go back to Australia, take the boomerang back to the mayor, and then yeah. over time you had to change that. How, just how fluid was it? Just how spur of the moment are those decisions? Well, that, that was a difficult time in the flight because um, the balloon was uh, going southeast over the uh, um, Indian Ocean and we knew through um, David and Luke's forecast that the thing was going to swing up to the north but it just took so long and uh, I've probably got to apologize to everybody in Australia because uh, I think I had three, 300 different questions about where it was going to land and oh. I gave 300 different, different answers. Different answers and they were waiting for him anxiously I and know, they were going to celebrate. I know. And it was, uh, you know, it's one of these things is that if you get a, a, a shift of about a couple of degrees in, in heading over a long um, track that can be hundreds of miles but but once it established on a, a northeasterly track we were pretty sure that it was going to land in Queensland so this happened just days before the 4th of July any specific impact that has on either of you well I mean it's I think it's a fitting thing that you know Steve landed on the 4th of July although it was the 4th of July in Australia I mean you know he's, he's an American hero now and it was a good good day for an American hero to land okay you know, you always have the what ifs. What ifs if he, if he landed in the middle of the ocean? No, oh, that's not I a mean, what if, but what if? But what if? If he'd have landed in the middle of the ocean, um, there was a search and rescue plan where uh, he's got these things called EPIRBs, which are emergency beacons, and they just go off, uh, they go up to a satellite, and then the satellite transfers them to a regional um, coordination center, and then they really take over from there. The uh, search and rescue for whatever country he's in will, will take over. And we were keeping the search and rescue uh, centers informed of his position and the air traffic control centers. That was my job um, to keep them informed exactly where he was so everybody knew exactly where he was at any one time. To Kevin Strauss, the air traffic control coordinator, mm. correct? And to David DeHaynow, assistant team meteorologist. Thank you to both. I Thank appreciate it. Thanks, Robin. Thanks for having us. Congratulations again. Thank Thanks a lot. Much.